Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and today I'm joined by Keegan Smith. So, Keegan, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for having me on. Super excited for it. Yeah, likewise. We were just saying before we hit record, you know, I've had th- this show generally is around nutrition and, uh, and fitness. And, you know, I've had uh, like one of my clients is one of the top child psychologists in Ireland. I had him on yesterday as well. But when I think about you, there's just so many different things like obviously the fitness to nutrition side of things but then wealth and travel languages all these things so there's I think we're going to be bouncing around a lot today just to see where you're at but before we jump into all that do you want to maybe explain or give a quick overview of of who you are and what you do so the bit of the background is uh, grew up loving sport and wanted to go to the olympics that was kind of the first really strong vision that I had I'd, presented that at school when I was like 12 years old this is what I want to do and then I had a lot of injuries along the path to that which I think a lot of people can identify with you want to be that top athlete but the body is like not quite doing what you wanted to do I was really slow and so I needed strength training to be able to be close to making that Olympic dream and then I think the way I trained also probably contributed to more injuries and stuff so that was like quite an early experience of strength training and wanting to be an athlete and then as a lot of people do, maybe in my late teens, early 20s, I just had that uneasy feeling like the world isn't really meant to be this way. I need to go and explore. I need to figure out what is actually going on here. Why are people doing these things for 40 years that they don't really want to do? Uh, why is everybody in debt? Like, I just don't get it. And so I went and traveled for almost all of my 20s. I left Australia when I was 21 and uh, I didn't move back until I was uh, like 30. So, yeah, just before my 30th. So during that time, I learned a bunch of different languages and I learned a lot about the world. I learned a lot of history. I met all sorts of people. I hitchhiked. I slept on floors. I uh, worked all kinds of different jobs and uh, basically was a, was a vagabond explorer for, for most of my 20s in between pieces of being a strength coach. So I was a strength coach when I first moved out of Australia. I worked with the London Broncos for a year. And then at the end of that period, uh, I worked for the Catalan Dragons. So just when I decided like, this vagabonding is, is harder work than it looks and wanted to actually do something that helped somebody a bit more, find some more purpose uh, and something that I was good at. Then I, I went back to strength training and, and worked with the, the Cadillac Dragons, which turned to working with the City Roosters. Every year those teams um, kind of did better than the, the team had gone the previous year and that led to opportunity with mentoring other coaches. I kind of knew from the start that I didn't want to be a rugby league strength coach um, forever as, as kind of my thing. I knew after all that travel, I kind of knew I wanted to have some kind of impact in the world that was beyond success in elite sport. But I did, you know, I was fortunate to, to be in a good environment uh, for success in elite sport and I contributed as much as I could. I don't know how much that contributed us to, to us, you know, winning and setting records and stuff. But, um, and so then, yeah, uh, I'm getting really long-winded, Hunter. I've been mentoring coaches since 2014 and uh, I had a brand called Real Movement, Real Movement Project. And, and then I started working with ATG for Coaches. And now I have Uncommon Success and ATG for Coaches that I, that I work for. So a little bit of the background. Yeah, I think that this is kind of a good place to maybe go into is mentoring. Because I first came across you, I was in Melbourne. Um, I did an apprenticeship in Fifth Element Wellness with Dave O'Brien. And then also I was training at Paris Little's gym in, in Praxis. And wow. that's, when, that's when you first came on the radar. And then <clears throat> I just kept on seeing these people popping up and they, they seem to be coming from real movements, you know, all of these real high level athletes. So maybe do you want to just talk about the mentoring, maybe spotting talent, developing people, and maybe how that journey started for you? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I knew that. If I did know it, I've forgotten. But Paris and Dave are like two of the highest level coaches. Like you really landed in a, in a great place. Um, yeah, I did. Dave's, yeah. Actually come, Dave's coming over here soon. We, we get on really well. He, he had me down to his gym to sort of mentor his team of trainers a few times. It was such a great place to be, that fifth element wellness that, that Dave and his partner put together. It's a mm. phenomenal training facility, like holistic wellness and yeah, Paris is one of the most knowledgeable uh, coaches and, and dedicated, you know, just phenomenal. Uh, he did a little bit of work for me for, for a short period of time there, one of my attempted projects with helping CrossFitters. But um, yeah, I, the, the question was uh, about like spotting talent and things. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't think I so much try and spot talent. It's people come to me and say like, 
you know, this, you know, I don't, I don't go looking for people. Uh, they, you know, I met Dave at a Poliquin event and um, yeah, we were both just there as students. And then we sort of stayed in touch a little bit and he asked me to, to come and work with his staff. Um, he knew that I was working with professional rugby league and whatnot before that. So yeah. And uh, Paris, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how we got in touch, but um, generally, yeah, people with ambition uh, who can see that maybe I might know something or I might have some connections that might help them to get to where they want to go a little bit sooner. They'll, they'll get in touch. Um, yeah. Sometimes like Lucas uh, Aaron, who has range of strength brand, our relationship started like this as a podcast. We did a podcast and then in the podcast, I was like, like, I think we're a really good fit to work together, man. And at the time, like I wasn't really making any money. I think I offered him like 500 bucks a month to, to work together. Like I was just getting a new thing off the ground and, uh, yeah, like 12 months later, we had 500 members. Um, you know, he was doing tons of the legwork. We had this range of strength. I was using the name range of strength all the time in my terminology because I liked it better than strength through length. But we were working, mm -hmm. you know, alongside Ben Patrick and stuff. And um, yeah, Lucas worked for me for the for 12 months. And then um, he kind of could see that he wanted to do his own thing and like full, full uh, transparency. Like it was tough when he left and um, it was, you know, different different factors in that but um yeah like that that's how it started with with lucas was literally like a podcast uh, with ben patrick i just saw his stuff on instagram and said like the world needs to know this like this is really important somewhere in our, in our conversations like it was really clear to me that he was special and that he had special knowledge that people don't have and uh yeah, I mean it's different with 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 each each of the stories. Um, Graham Tuttle is another one now. The the barefoot sprinter who's yeah you know, had him on a few weeks ago. Really interesting yeah, guy. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think uh, I think you know he's going to change the world as as much as anyone in fitness as well. And so it's just yeah, it's really exciting to 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 see people explore their potential, realize that they can do a lot more than they thought they could do. Um, you know, go from a position of kind of frustration and not doing what they want. Like Lucas, I think had five online clients when we when we first spoke, and he, he wanted to get out of the job that he was in. You know, and twelve months later, he's you know he's he's uh, he he was in a really good position to go his own way with his business. I think you know, he has um, he has he has hundreds of hundreds of clients and a really strong brand that, that's growing faster than mine. You know, he's he's uh, got more followers than me on Instagram now. So it's um, that's the goal. I mean, Graham's got multiples many multiples in mine and that's that's the goal for me like yeah because i i came across him you posted it um you were like great check out graham Tuttle. i think yeah. i think you congratulated him on getting twenty thousand followers and i then i started following him then and and then now he's got like 160 or 200 something crazy like um but yeah his his stuff is really good um with regards to training, you're obviously you're doing strength and conditioning. Then you kind of got into Edo Portel stuff for a while. Would that be kind of the trajectory? And then you've kind of gone into the more ATG approach or the, uh, would it be long range, short range? Would that be kind of the way you'd describe it? Yeah, so I've, I've pretty much been into every system. Like I'm an explorer type and I want to know about everything. So <laughs> I tend to do a deep dive as deep as I can, as fast as I can into anything that intrigues me, whether that's in training or other, other areas. But yeah, I did the, I went to the Edo Portal internship in 2013. The team that I worked with won the grand final against all the odds. Like we weren't even predicted to make the finals. We ended up winning the regular season, winning the grand final, setting an all-time record for defensive uh, you know, teams held to zero, opposition teams held to zero. The next day I flew out to, uh, to Edo Portal. So while everyone was drinking, I was like preparing to go to Thailand. And um, yeah, I've been to a number of his events. He had a huge impact on the way I look at training. Uh, I, yeah, I love that he's invented a new genre of training and movement and you know, he's a pioneer in so many ways. It's not just the, the method, it's also the marketing and, and stuff, which uh, he, he really took things to a different and new level. Um, so yeah, that was, I think that was, I think I've paid the most money to him out of anyone in strength and conditioning. Like I've invested more in business courses and stuff, but I think I've actually paid the most money to, to Edo Portal for knowledge, um, which is, yeah, was money well spent and still I'm very grateful for it because I can, you know, do a handstand and muscle ups and all sorts of different things that I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't have had that 
influence and, and you know you could say oh you would have learned it from someone else but like it was him <laughs> he's the one who put it all on the map um mm -hmm. you mean there was gymnastic bodies as well right I did, I did a bunch of stuff with coach summer there at one stage um but yeah Ido did something really special in terms of the way he got it out i mean it, so did coach summer as well to be fair um mm -hmm. in terms of yeah like i was really into the poliquin i was really into everything to be honest like i i love so many different systems so many great coaches um, Pavel Tsatsilin and Dan John's stuff has had a huge impact on me. There, there's a lot. Uh, when I when I came across Ben Patrick, it was the fact that he was using the sequence of Poliquin movements and valuing them differently to anyone I'd ever seen. So people say, oh, it's just the Poliquin stuff. It's like saying a cake is just made from sugar, flour, and eggs. It's like, yeah, okay, but someone's going to pay $1,000 to go to a Michelin, you know, three-star restaurant to have that sugar, flour, and eggs, and another person is, is going to make some lumpy thing that no one wants to eat, which would be what I would – I'm not a cake maker. Um, it's, it matters how the things are sequenced, how it's put together, how it's delivered. Like, all of those details are what make a – and Ben – it was clear that his training system was taking things to a new level. And since then he's taken fitness marketing, fitness business, app, app development, custom app development, which is about to come online. He's taking all, a coach support in the pulse of ATG is like absolutely phenomenal. Like he's taken so many things to a new level that I haven't seen. I've been in everything. I've looked at everything. I've bought everything as much as you can. Uh, and there's been nothing, anything like uh, Ben Patrick in the fitness world, as far as I've seen. And, and Graham Tuttle was actually pretty pioneering. I mean, it's I think he's going to add some different flavors to things as well, which is just super exciting. It's just great, it's great seeing people take a unique approach to things and, and execute and win. Um, I would say the best coach at using that long and short range would be uh, Nico Di Paoli. He's also an ATG for coaches coach. Uh, yeah. Motion motion guy. He's I'm building a village. Programming. Uh, I've been doing this programming for the last like four months. That's what I, cause I, I, I'd like you to maybe explain the short and long range in a bit more detail. Yeah. Cause I've been, I've been following his programs. I think they're yeah. brilliant, but I still don't completely maybe grasp the concept. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's, he's, and he's another one of your kind of, uh, he's kind of learned a lot from you over the years. What do you have? He, he worked for me for a little while, maybe a few months when I was just trying to get real movement off the ground again, like a bit before Lucas, uh, and yeah, like we were talking about everything, goals for life, building apps, um, training systems. And yeah, Nico's like, he's executed what I would execute if I was good at the details of execution. <laughs> like he's done exactly <laughs> what I would have done. Um, it's, it's the best like representation of like real movement training system uh -huh. is, is like kind of what he's done. And he's, he's got his own flavors and his own details and he's gone in different directions, like full credit to him. But if, if there was one person who's like nailed what I wanted to nail, it's it's Nico, um, mm -hmm. and and he's got his custom app and stuff as well, which just, you know keeps getting better. So it's super inspiring to see. I think he's twenty six or something, and he's you know he's living the dream of he's got a, his own custom app. He's he's got a, you know good following and, and good number of people doing his program. He keeps making that better and better, and he's setting up a village in in Bali. He's got a gym in the city in Bali, and there he's, he's setting up a another site so uh, but yeah the short range long range thing the best way to understand it if you don't understand it yeah is to go to my youtube and watch the like the videos about it there's sort of like 20 minute videos that break down all things in a way that i'm not going to be able to right now yeah. um, but there's there's videos there about tension as well which is like a key concept that i don't think strength coaches are thinking about as much or as well as they they could i think that yeah that that's sort of my contribution to atg for coaches is to help to decode why the program is so successful. Ben is phenomenal at upgrading the, 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 pro, the, the, the program and, um, you know, getting the message across and, and, and like the actual programming and an exact like cookie cutter, clear thing that people can follow and execute on that is extremely, you know, successful. It's not going to, like it's, it's really highly successful for, for something that is anyone can jump on. Um, mm -hmm. My role within the system has been to explain like why, why, why is it so much better than everything else that we've seen? Like so much so that there's just thousands and thousands of people who've said, this changed my life. I worked on this for so long. I had these surgeries and did all these things. Um, and this was the thing that worked. So 
my, in my my way of thinking, like that's what I've put onto YouTube is like exactly why the, the program works. And within ATG for coaches, my goal is that, that people actually understand it and study it properly in a way that mm-hmm. people often don't on YouTube. You might watch it once and then sort of move on. But a, a number of people have told me they've watched the videos like several times and it's changed the way they think about programming and stuff. Nico gets it very, very deeply and he's applied it very well. And like his training has gone to another level since he's applied that short and long range stuff in great detail. Like he didn't have a lot of the movements that he has now. Um, it's specifically like building specific strength in specific positions with, with specific logic uh, has, has helped him to take it to another level. I'm not as dedicated to my training, like full transparency. I love business so much. I've you know had family. I've been moving around. I haven't had a gym. Like excuses, excuses. But I'm not like I'm not the best proponent of my own system. I'm okay. I'm training, but I'm not like him and Ben are like applying and Lucas as well. Like they're applying their own stuff phenomenally well. Um, I, I plan to do that over the next little bit. In a nutshell, though, to answer your question, short range, short range is when the muscle is in a shortened position and, and, and you're, you're uh, you know, flexing the muscle. So if I was like laying forward on bicep curls, like spider curls, then that would be a mm-hmm. short range movement. Even if I'm letting the elbow, even if it's full range of motion, full range of motion actually means nothing to me. It, it matters like where the movement is difficult. So in a spider curl, the movement's difficult at the top when the muscle is short. What that means is mm-hmm. you're going to have a, a, a strong muscle mind uh, connection the neurological gains are going to be strong, but the structural gains will be lesser. Now, if you do a lot of training, you still get structural gains, but compared to laying on your back and doing incline bicep curls or laying on a flat bench and doing curls where you're getting like crazy stretch, you feel like your bicep's going to snap, your pec's going to snap. When you're training like that, you're tearing the muscle to bits and it's a very different training stimulus. It doesn't matter about the weight and the sets and reps as much as it matters about the movement selection. And this is the biggest revelation in strength training in a long time. Like that's why ATG works and coaches don't understand this. There's still the dominant paradigm in the research and from the research based coaches until recently has been, it, it's you're working a certain muscle group and you need to think about the volume of work that you do for that muscle group. Mm-hmm. That's been the dominant paradigm. That paradigm is broken. It doesn't work when you're talking about, uh, especially if you're talking about injury um, prevention and rehabilitation, if you're talking about maximal hypertrophy, it also doesn't work. Um, it's just a like an archaic way. It's like black and white TV versus, you know, the new TVs, you know, full color, flat screen, 3D, whatever. You, you, you've got, when you've got better logic, you can program better and you can get better results with less injuries, less niggles, less frustrations. I used to always get like tendonitis in my biceps whenever I started working on the one-arm chin and getting quite close to it. I kind of accepted that if I, if I was going to squat more, my knees were going to hurt. If I was going to get close to the one-arm chin, my biceps were going to hurt. And to like most people had accepted that, like people doing other people's programs, like that was the experience they were getting as well. Now it's not like that. It doesn't, nothing hurts anymore uh, when, you, when I'm using this logic. And of course, if you do go too, too much volume and too much long range work, it'll hurt and you'll hurt yourself, but you know exactly why you hurt yourself and you know exactly what to do about it. So the logic of reverse out knee pain actually works at every joint in the body, like a dream. And so, you know, there's a coach called Dawson Windham, uh, who's a power lifter, who's, who's dived really deep into ATG. Uh, he's pushing for world records in power lifting, super smart guy, does online coaching and stuff. He's, he's like crazy good in long range. He's the only power lifter I've ever seen who can, you know, he can do barbell dislocates, um he he, like he can do that atg stuff really well he's huge and he's pushing for world records in powerlifting and he's supple and so it just smashes the paradigm of all these powerlifters who've been like they'll just get tight as shit and they can't you know bend over they can't touch their toes they they buy into this concept of like the rigid spine and all that sort of stuff you can do it that way and be successful because most of them are doing it that way but you can also use the like the atg logic um and get a, get a phenomenal result while still having a body that actually works. And maybe it actually potentiates strength further. That's, I think, what Dawson is going to prove because he's N equals one and he's close to breaking world records. So it's very difficult to do with that. If, if we had a 1,000 of these and a 1,000 of those, I'm pretty sure this 1,000 would lift a lot heavier a lot sooner because they avoid injuries. But will that study, you know, when's that study going to happen? I don't know. I think research actually needs to be 
massively disrupted by technology as well. If, if we can do research through the ATG app or if research can be done in that way, if we can make collaborations. I know Ben's been speaking a lot with Squat University. Mm-hmm. I, th- I, th- I think like if these worlds can come together in the near future where academia and the people who are actually getting the really good results and have funding and things, if those things could come together in a really transparent, honest way, uh, I think that would be huge for the strength training world. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's interesting because like there's a lot of different systems out there and some of them, <laughs> like in particular, a lot of the people that we're talking about, they're, they're high level, they're really driven, they're really most likely very type A and, and athletically in a good position. So some programs, basically the cream will rise to the top and everyone else might get broken on the way up uh, and they just get forgotten about and you see the testimonials of the people who make it through. But it seems that the ATG system is very much built around like longevity, like you feel better doing it. And it does seem to be a very like legitimate approach versus just giving someone a ton of volume and just the kind of the freaks will get through. And, you know, you don't see all the all the people who got broken on the way through the journey. Right. Yeah. If you know, if 80 percent of people are getting a result in your program, you're doing really well. As if it's a generic program and you're getting you know, if 20 percent of people are getting results. Everyone's going to get some results, uh, mm-hmm. but it's it, the ratios and the, you know, the feedback. And um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a, it's a good concept that you're bringing forward there. Yeah. And like thinking about the same, I guess, approach with nutrition. I know you're, you're a big pro- proponent of, you know, a meat heavy diet. Personally, I've in 2020 i had really severe mouth ulcers for literally eight months you know i'm prone to mouth ulcers my whole life but i literally had them consistently like five six seven mouth ulcers in my mouth for like eight months and tried lots of different things autoimmune paleo and nothing happened i did strict carnivore they were gone in 10 days um so like i'm completely sold on it but do you think there are any people out there who maybe shouldn't be going to such extreme you know to such an extreme extent with, with food in particular because of all of the I guess emotional attachments to it yeah I was going to say vegans and that's kind of where you're where you're coming from a little bit like if if ideologically you, you can't do it then don't do it um there are people who have done well for a significant period of time on on diets that I would do really poorly on um some of that I think is individual difference. Some of it is is probably like what you've been through in your lifetime. I think I damaged my health quite a lot during that time in my twenties, um, and maybe I mean I had health issues all the way growing up as a child. I was skinny, couldn't put on weight. I had different health problems. Like I'm not going to give you my medical, you know, history, but it's like a sad story. And so for me, like I was always looking for something better because I it was always decreasing my quality of life, and so. When I found, uh, I listened to the Joe Rogan, Sean Baker podcast, 2017, uh, about the carnival diet. And I just started that day and I was like, I'm just going to give this a shot because I had mm. hay fever um, that was, you know, I'm a presenter. I'm, I'm someone who you know, that's in front of people using my voice, talking about health, talking about performance, having hay fever is terrible for, for someone in that position. And I refused to take the medications that would kind of mask. There's obviously something going on here that I need to work on. Um, and so I, d- I did it strict for like six months, just straight from that day, from like listening to the podcast, like randomly. I'm not sure someone probably sent it to me or I don't, I don't remember mm. the story now. But I was literally like, OK, I'll give this a shot because it's, it's, it sucks. And so I was going to a training camp and I had a four day training camp at Mitch, Mitch Pike's gym in, in Canberra that we was driving to. And that's when I listened to the podcast and I got there and I was like, yeah, OK, I'm carnivore now. Uh, I'm just going to test this thing out. And at that time, like no one knew what carnival was. It was like the most yeah, disgusting. Early, early, <laughs> early with that whole thing. Yeah. And it, and it was, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. You know, I didn't know if I was going to feel terrible. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, but I went straight into it. That training camp, like we train all day. We usually meet each other first thing in the morning. And then, you know, the day finishes when the day finishes, usually the sun's gone down. So we'd like, train and mastermind and you know go for walks and whatever like all day but it's like you're physically absolutely destroyed by the end of the camp and pretty much mentally emotionally as well because <laughs> you have so many ups and downs and things that are confronting and so that was like when I first thought of it and um, I didn't know if I was you know challenged by the diet or challenged by everything else but 
I haven't personally come across anyone who doesn't do well with it. Uh, initially, in the first few days of it, for sure, like people have different things that they experience with their digestive system and stuff. Some people talk about having diarrhea for a significant period of time. Like that's come up on the Joe Rogan thing. If you think about it, diarrhea is the way the body flushes stuff out of the out of itself that it doesn't want. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, if it is that the body is cleaning out things that it wasn't previously able to clean out for whatever reason. But yeah, there have, I've had hundreds of athletes, friends, other people who've done the carnival diet. Um, there's, there's a few who've said it wasn't ideal for them for whatever reason, but there are like many, many stories of that's phenomenal. Most of them don't do carnival. They just do like 90% meat based and have a bit of whatever. That's pretty much been me for mm. for quite a while now. Um, I don't, I'm not religious with it. I'm, I feel better if I am, but I know I can always just reset with a few days of being like super strict with it and I'm like everything gets better. So um, that's the way I look at it and my experience of it. I know there like there is that whole emotional side to things and like it's it is interesting all the yogic type stuff of you know, live on air and, um, you know, live on like these, these kind of energy balancing things. And I think from a spiritual perspective, like I did a seven day fast when I was basically vegan, I was vegetarian for nine months at one stage and I had really poor health results with that. And then I was basically was vegan? vegan. How long ago was that? Uh, that was 2007. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah quite a while back but i'm one to experiment i want to test things for myself and know for myself uh, i was hanging out with a lot of kind of hippie protesting type people in latin america and a lot of them were mm -hmm. vegetarian and vegan and i had a bit of an internal identity shift during those adventures and i think the vegetarianism was a way to try and show people that hey i'm not the person who left here uh, a couple of years ago i think it was kind of part of that or um, mm -hmm. but yeah eventually i realized like my training's not working. I'm getting, you know, problems with my health that I hadn't had before. New problems. Uh, like I couldn't, couldn't gain muscle, wasn't gaining strength as I usually would. I felt terrible. It was like, okay, well, this is, you know, this isn't making me a better person. Even if it is saving the world, like I'm, I'm not going to do this uh, ongoing. So I stopped it. But then in 2016, I was really intrigued by the whole vegan thing again. And I went sort of like almost like keto vegan. So I was having a bit of meat, but very little, and then heaps of fats, heaps of greens, and a lot of fasting. And I was really intrigued by fasting at that stage. And Wim Hof as well, actually. So I'd been to the Wim Hof event. So I fasted for seven days, and I was into Wim Hof at the same time. And I can tell you that, like, you just go, you go so fast into a different realm. Um, if anyone's had, like, kind of strange experiences with, with breathing techniques or with um, – you know, DMT, ayahuasca, all that mushrooms. I haven't been on the chemical side of things, but a lot mm. of people say there's overlap between when you go really deep on breath work with some of that stuff. Um, Graham Tuttle's into it. I don't know if you got into that in your conversation. But um, when you fast, man, you just go so, so deep, so quick. And so it makes sense that yogis and stuff were like accessing whatever they access. And I do think there is something to all that ancient wisdom just doesn't help that much for strength training and this material world in existence. So like, I don't fully shit on the like veganism and whatever. I know there's a lot of hate from the carnivore community towards veganism. And like, that's not cool either. Like I've been that person sometimes and like, it's, I don't like that there's a bit of a war on meat and meat production and farming and like all that stuff is, it's another conversation, but it's politics. People should, you know, people should get along. People should respect each other's, uh, opinions and perspectives on these things as much as as much as possible and it's cool to have you know debate but th that's where i would say the vegan diet is probably better and, and a lot of fasting and stuff probably better for that person who wants to be able to leave their body really quickly and um, mm -hmm. yeah those kinds of experiences so yeah, that's i didn't know that answer was going to come out but yeah that's probably uh the people yeah who no do it as well yeah it's really interesting because um obviously i'm personally very sold on a meat heavy diet just because of the results you know they're like there's the, is the cure i got in such a quick space of time but then my father he's got stage four prostate cancer and he you know the kind of most of the cancer recommendations well from the from the oncologist is nothing it's basically just like i'll see you in a year <laughs> like it's an absolute joke um 
but it's mostly like plant-based, you know, low fat, low, uh, no meat. And he did that for all last year, but then it was actually through you. I uh, um, came across Misha. Um, the, yeah. yeah. So I, I did some coaching with Misha last year and then I just told my dad about it. So he went full carnivore <laughs> from full vegan, but it's really interesting because obviously it's all anecdotal. We don't know how it's going to turn out. He, he, he might be gone in a few months or he might be okay for, indefinitely but we went down to see relatives like last month in ireland and they were all saying when we saw you last year to my dad like you looked really like you were on the way out you look way better now and that was you know he feels better he looks better all these things so it's it's an interesting um you know and then the research as well like uh the what's the psychiatric lady georgie Ead, is it about yeah, my, my grandfather died from cancer, you know, and it's like, yeah, it just making me a bit emotional. <laughs> I don't remember the last time I cried, but, but it's, uh, it's, 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 I'm really happy for you, for your father. And, uh, Misha, Misha Sakharov is a, is a really good, good human. Um, and it's, yeah, um, as you say, who knows where it's going to go, but I've, I know Misha's had a lot of these kind of stories. And so mm. um, it's, it's, I'm I'm really glad that you you shared that with me and that things have gone in that direction. <laughs> yeah, man, it's the impact you can have, you know, like that's literally from what you put out there and, and action did, and that's actually had a, a really positive impact. So yeah, we'll see where things go with all that. But I guess it just, for me, it just, it's interesting because a lot of it is definitely political around what's right, what's wrong. But when you kind of have personal experience about what's making you feel the best or the person you know feel the best, there doesn't seem to be a lot of negatives around, you know, a, a meat heavy diet for optimal health. If you are in a position where your, your health is extremely compromised, either physically or um, psychologically. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of really good results with it. And I'm also very interested in farming, agriculture, you know, carbon sequestration, you know, carbon is best sequestered by fast growing grass. The way you make fast growing grass is by having animals grazing the grass if you take away the grazing animals then you start to see a lot more soil erosion you start to see a lot more dirt and so carbon sequestration which seems to be like a hot topic the, the most important thing you can do for it is to improve the soil quality if you want to end a civilization historically one of the ways that you end a civilization is to decrease the quality of the soil the romans were known to salt the earth of the people they were fighting against so they couldn't produce food so they had to submit and, and buy into the food supply. Uh, this is this is something that has strong historical roots that we need healthy soil. And so healthy soil is actually a key part of this conversation as well. And yeah, it gets it gets complex and it gets uh, it gets deep in terms of what is actually going on with the environmental agenda at one stage was about mass extinction of animals. It was about poisons in, in the rivers, in the oceans and poisons in the food supply. And the environmental discussion has become something about what the combination of gases are in the air. Um, and, and we've forgotten all these other parts are not really much of a part of this environmental discussion. And these are the probably the things that I'm most interested in discussing, mass extinction, poisons in the food, poisons in the water supply. Um, I think we should consider what we're doing with all of that, burning plastics, um, pollution in, inside the cities. We know that pollution in cities you know, is killing people. Like people die younger because of air pollution. Like these are huge issues. Um, the, how much carbon is, is in the air is is a different kind of conversation, and uh, you know I don't think it's as important as the other one. So yeah, like all of these things need they need to be discussed. I'm not the world expert in anything. I'm, I'm a curious person who's trying to live really well and trying to help athletes live really well, and, and now like you know, more generally, more people, um, whatever, whatever works for that, I, I'm, I'm interested in. And yeah, I'll explore all sides of it. So if meat's really good for people who are sick, but it's not good for, for the planet. Okay. Well, let's like, how do we, what's the, what's the discussion here? What do we need to do? Um, but there's clearly been some agenda about meat, demonizing meat production, meat for health, meat for land, meat for gases, um, this, there's a lot of stuff there that doesn't quite add up. The, the deeper you go into it, the more it seems as though 
there's some other agenda. Who knows what it is, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't seem to be about health or about the environment when when you go deeper, as far as uh, as as my experience, my research shows. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you kind of touched on helping people with regards to staying or creating freedom for people. Uh, I think we'll shift gears into more like the wealth and travel side of things and crypto side of things, um, because as a personal trainer it's you know it's a very high dropout rate first and foremost i think it's like 70 percent dropout rate in the first three years you really have to be self-employed if you want to actually make a legitimate income and stay in the industry it's very hard to just be basically on minimum wage in a gym so something that i think you started talking about and, and started helping people with which i think is really really beneficial for myself included is just around wealth generation and thinking more long term about creating something because if you're a self-employed pt uh you're only getting paid when you're showing up there's no pension plan there's nothing like that in place so do you want to maybe just riff on that for a bit about kind of your kind of when, when this all started and the goals going forwards yeah so when you think about it like the people who deal with people who've messed up their bodies whose bodies don't function very well anymore those people make a lot of money. Those people drive Ferraris, Lamborghinis, they got holiday houses. The people who deal with the broken people get paid really well. And that's that's cool. That's fair. That's good. What about the people who stop people being broken? How much money do they make? The people who create chemicals and things that help people when they're when they're broken, they make a lot of money. But what about the things that you can put in your body that stop you from needing to have those things? Well, that's a really difficult business to be in. That's the business of organic farming. It's not easy. The business of teaching people how to be really healthy, it's, it's not easy. You have to be really good at business because the expectations of society is that that's really cheap and that's really expensive. So you go and pay, you know, you pay $500 an hour for, for these kind of services and, and, and you pay, you know, $8 an hour for these kind of services. And so the value skew in society is, is really way out of whack. And I, I, would love more coaches to consider themselves to be doing work that is of equal importance to the people who are dealing with, okay, your health is broken. Now you, you know, you go and see that person, they, they cut something out or they, you know, burn something or whatever they do. What about the people who, you know, can, can stop that or can help people not to need to, to be cut and whatnot, but we have to do it ourselves. Like we have to, we have to improve our own esteem and it's like such a flooded industry people are working for no money the standards are low it's very difficult for a consumer like for someone who wants to interact with this economy very difficult for them to identify who has just got their certificates or not even got their certificates and just put like link in bio i'm a personal trainer versus someone who's done 10 years 20 years of research they're, they're top of the game they've had amazing results it's not that easy for someone to tell. Like people literally lift the before and afters of people like Nick Mitchell, who's been at the top of the game for a long time, Poliquin education, whatnot. They literally steal his before and afters and put them in, the, in their websites and, and on their Instagrams. Um, and he, you know, he regularly exposes people for doing that sort of stuff. So it's difficult. It's difficult for the customer and it's difficult for the coach to, to be that sort of premium service um, and being an entrepreneur is, is not easy. Like we're not educated in a way that we're going to be successful in business. Like we know that 90% of small businesses fail in the first year. Those, these kind of statistics of like, doesn't matter what business you're in, it's difficult. In personal training is even more difficult because it's a flooded market. It's kind of fun to do. People like being in the gym. So they're like, oh, I can be in the gym for a job. But then you realize like, oh, no, you can't because you can't make any money. Um, and so it's it's really it's, it's not, it's not great. It's not great that uh, it's, it is difficult. You do need to build business skills. And I would say 99% of coaches going into personal training underestimate the amount of business knowledge that they'll need to have. I didn't, you know, I've never actually been a personal trainer. I was a strength coach for rugby teams. And then I wanted to mentor people to do what I did. The team that I worked with won and set all sorts of records and players were happy and they thought that it was better than what they'd done before. So I was like, cool, I'll teach this to other people. I'll travel the world. And then I'll work on like how I can deal with some of these other things that I'm concerned about with, you know, food and education and these other things. Like somehow I'll end up getting to that stuff if I can help people do that stuff. Because people are buying these exercise science degrees and coming out the other side, whether they got their master's or their PhD, 
most of them are not getting what they wanted out of that degree. They put a lot of time in, they put a lot of money in, and they're not getting what they wanted. So if I can help them get that for a lot less and go further, then that's a good business in my, in my mind. But what I ended up doing was working with a lot of personal trainers, and I did help them to have a lot higher esteem. Most of them were running something similar to a CrossFit type model, but charging uh, usually about 50% more than what the CrossFit boxes were uh, with smaller group sizes. Uh, but that was that was roughly the model that a lot of the gyms that I worked with, I had over 100 people who came to me wanting to have a gym and then they had a gym, like over 100 people started gyms. And so it was working and a lot of them were, you know, they were masterminding with each other. It wasn't like business coaching for gyms. I kind of disliked a lot of how that worked as well. They were taking a lot of money off people and a lot of it was really generic um, and not that good. And it, it's all new scenes and everyone's doing their best. Like it's not about like hating on people, but um, mm. yeah, like I, I thought if coaches are really good, then this will work. And it, it, it did, like it worked for a lot of them. My issue was that I couldn't see how it was going to scale and change the world because unlike CrossFit, like I didn't, I didn't know, like I didn't create a brand that people were branding around. So it worked for coaches, but it was only coaches that knew about it. So it was like reinventing the wheel. Every single coach that I worked with, it wasn't really creating a cumulative effect like I, like I wanted. So um, that was kind of why I, I slowed down with, with real movement. But yeah, man, like it's helping coaches to, to get a great income and to deliver a phenomenal service and to really hold themselves in high esteem and value themselves as business people, value themselves as, as service providers. Like, I, I, I love that. And I, I love that. Uh, I love that I've been able to do that with a lot of people and I want to do it with a lot more. <laughs> yeah. For a coach who's listening, for myself included as well, what sort of advice would you give from a, maybe just more thinking a bit more long-term from a wealth generation uh, point of view and just kind of setting yourself up for the best possible outcomes moving forwards. Yeah. So the thing, probably the biggest revelation in the last few years, one of my biggest learnings is that it doesn't matter how much money you're making. It's irrelevant to whether you become wealthy or not. And that sounds ridiculous because it's like everybody knows if I made another five grand, a year then i could start investing and i'd start becoming wealthy the thing is everybody feels like that all the time so everybody thinks they're 500 dollars a month away from being in a good position i've, I've seen that over and over again it doesn't matter how much money they're making if they make another 500 dollars if they make another thousand dollars a month then they can start becoming wealthy and it just doesn't work that day never comes it's like tomorrow i'm going to start my diet tomorrow i'm going to start my training plan no start today you can start becoming wealthy today if you make the decision that some of what you earn stays with you forever. And this is like a concept that was completely foreign to me. The idea that you have to buy stuff with your money that you plan to never sell. And so if, if you consistently buy things that you will never sell, then you become wealthy. Like by definition, if you buy things that massively decrease in value, over like if everything that you buy goes to zero in value then it won't work but what are the chances that everything that you would buy if you did decide to become wealthy chances that everything that you buy is going to go to zero is, is pretty low unless you put it all on you know nfts and the latest fad crypto and you know you can probably find a way but if you have any kind of logic of like any of the things that anyone who's advised over wealth like i'm not a wealth advisor i'm, I'm this is not financial advice i'm a Strength coach, washed up strength coach is doing his best to say <laughs> everybody. Else. Uh, but it's like logic of like, and it had never occurred to me. Like this is logic that came from a multi-millionaire, successful, you know, serial millionaire mentor uh, who had uh, he's seventy now, is an Australian who decided to become financially abundant when he was forty, and he's been teaching other people four years later or something. He was a millionaire. And he's been teaching people how to do it since then. And he's the wisest human that I've come across. And that's... What's uh, his name? Paul Council. Oh, yeah. I've heard you talk about it. Yeah. So we, I started working with him. A friend of mine told me, hey, you need to check this out with this guy. And he, and he, he sent me these tests to do. So one of them was like a spiral dynamic test. The other was a genius typing test. And so it's like to learn about yourself. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've done all this sort of stuff before. Like just filled it out. But like I was really... 
like it took me a while to fill it out. And then like, I didn't really care about the results. I didn't study them that well. And then I had a call with this man. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I really, uh, I really should have prepared for this. Cause I'm like meeting, I met the, the most, you know, wise human that I've uh, come across and he knew me better than I knew myself. And it just like shocked me because <laughs> I thought like, I've been researching everything. I'm a, I'm a research, you know, lover. I've been researching everything I could about money uh, for about a year at that stage because I decided to become wealthy about a year before that because I had financial stress. We bought a house, we renovated. We, we bought what year mortgage, was this? To be more detailed. Uh, 2017, I bought a mortgage. That uh, was my dream location, like retreat on the hill, have people come, have an amazing experience, change your life, you know, go back to where you come from in the country, in Australia. Like this was, I'd been talking about it for three years or so at that stage and that was like my big dream was to have three locations like that around the world where i could go to and people could come and we would do these things and it would be good times you know ice bars and around the fire and all sorts of conversations as well as like training super hard uh, and i've been doing those experiences over and over again but i felt like if i had my own physical location it would be better for the brand better for the experience and that's like all I could think of to do with money was to do that. And I'd saved some money at that point. Like I'd been more successful in business than I ever could have imagined. And I thought, I want to put, you know, this is what money's for, is to make the world better. Like, let's put it into this. And then, uh, yeah, the cost, the renovations blew out. And then the negativity of all the things that were going on financially, like negatively impacted the business. And I made a few decisions that didn't really pay off. I tried to start a franchise of gyms uh, that, that didn't, do what I was thinking it was going to do, did what it needed to do, but it didn't do what I, what I was thinking it was going to do. And so, uh, yeah, like 2019, I decided, okay, like I have to become wealthy. Like this is bullshit. This is getting in the way of my quality of life. If I apply myself and learn about wealth in the way that I've done to training, to travel, to languages, to other things, like I'm sure I can do this. I just need to make the decision. And so I did. I invested like 45 grand in a, in a program uh, with one person and then, I just kept researching, kept learning. And um, yeah, like a year later, I met this Paul and I was like, well, this is the best thousand uh, dollars I've ever kind of paid. And I, and I asked him on the call, like, okay, how does it work to work together? And I thought he said it was 15 grand a month. And I was like, Ooh, like I could probably do a month or two, but you know, it's going to be a tough one to tell, uh, you know, my, my partner at the time and whatnot, like, it's like, oh, this is, you know, 15 grand a month. Like that's a stretch. Um, and uh, it turned out it, was only, it, was, it wasn't that much. I'd, I'd like misheard him or I don't know if he said it differently or whatever. But uh, yeah, I started working with him once a while and then I was just having these phenomenal conversations that I didn't know. All sorts of things I'd never thought about, heard about anything, with, especially a lot of human psychology stuff. Uh, like he brands himself as money, money mastery mentor and, you know, brands around money, but it's actually a lot about human psychology and, and how the world works and uh, as well as money and business copywriting all that sort of stuff but so after a few months of that i was like okay i need to tell my friends about this and so 40 of us went on a 12-month journey with him um grant tuttle was one of them he's probably the star student um rugby rugby uh conditioning coach i think he's the graham rugby tuttle is the barefoot guy no yeah yes yes exactly yeah graham was the star student of the rugby development oh. coach pat Searson was probably the other star oh, student. i mean a lot of the guys have done well but Graham was Graham was one of the star students. He he like was listening to it every day, uh, the, the the resources and the, he was doing things in the background. It wasn't looked like it wasn't really working for him. And then twelve months later, he just uh, his income and audience and everything has just gone exponential. And yeah, now he's learning from a lot of different people. And as we all have chapters and things like, but uh, yeah, I, that was the the journey with with Paul. And I, it was really a case of like when the when the student's ready, the master will appear, all that sort of thing. Um, it was really like that for me. And yeah, I'm, I'm so fortunate that a friend of mine introduced me to him. And uh, probably one of the things that I treasure most as far as my life experiences so far is to be able to interact with this person. Because, I mean, what do you have if it's not for your like, you know, knowledge and, and ideas and how you think about yourself? And, I've got a lot of work to do within the within the way that he's teaching things, um, but I, I wasn't aware that I had that work to do. Like the spiral dynamic stuff. If someone's like listening to this and they want to go look something up, like the Claire Graves spiral dynamic system is is definitely worth worth exploring. 
it's really difficult to find good stuff about it. It's like obscure for some reason. Um, Claire Graves was like a mainstream researcher, psychologist. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is really well known in the psychology world. People refer to it all the time. I did psychology at university, two subjects. Heard about that, heard about Skinner, heard about a bunch of different people. Never heard about this Claire Graves fella. He was the mentor of Maslow or he was the supervisor or something like that. And he had a system, like he was critical of Maslow. He had a system that to me is like infinitely better than Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I, I had never heard of it. Um, and it's pretty small, like as far as if you, if you look for it on YouTube and whatnot, like there's a few places where you can get the testing done. There's a free one that's, that's pretty bad. And then it's like, it's obscure, you know? And so, but then it turns out like, I'll let you get back to the questions and stuff. But so another person, friend of mine is- Keep um, going, man. Keep going. Adam Commons is uh, the head of high performance with Belgium Hockey. And he actually introduced me to this system through a company called People Change, which is a really cool Dutch company. That, that's, I think it's, it's not that accessible either, but um, he was working with Dutch hockey and they were like 15th in the world, like small nation as far as field hockey goes. He went there. They became the second nation in the world. Like they were, they were winning some silvers and making some finals and they, they'd done really well. He's a great coach. He then implemented people change. And since then, they've won a number of world titles from this obscure hockey nation that, you know, no one thought was good at anything. They've never been any good till him. And then he credits the people change system for taking them to the next level. So understanding his athletes and whether they're more, it's a color coded system. So it's like red. Uh, it's, and, and, and so we've adopted that system as the underpinning for uncommon success. So it's red. That's what I was about uh, to say to you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, red, red, blue, orange, green, yellow. And each of them have, and you develop them all at the same time, but it's also somewhat hierarchical as well, where the stronger your red is, the less rejection you have of red, then the easier it is to be able to be successful in blue and to be successful in orange. And so it's a phenomenal system that Paul, well, uh, Adam introduced it to me first. And then Paul was like, made me actually sit and think about it and learn it and read the books. And, and then his lectures on it like took me deep. And now I'm reconnecting with Adam to mentor me in using it better with sort of athletes and coaches and hopefully having more coaches in our community be able to apply it with their, their clients, um, with, with personal training and with, with working with athletes. So, yeah. With the colors, do you want to give a quick overview about that? Like what it means or is it kind of beyond the scope of, of this conversation? No, not really. Like, so the red one is like, uh, I've put affirmations with each of them to try and make it that you do remember. Like, so the red one's I am powerful. And the red one is about like, go through the brick wall, get it done. Um, hard work, discipline, like, especially like, like uh, being able to push through the pain barrier type stuff. Uh, of like that, that, that sort of thing as far from an athlete perspective. Um, and, and it turns out that a lot of people have a strong rejection of red. And it's, you know, sometimes it can be due to like not having a strong masculine energy in, in uh, childhood and whatnot. We don't go back into a lot of that. It's not that kind of regressive therapy stuff, but it's like self-awareness of, okay, this is who I am right now. And, and the concept is that you can develop consciously. You can, you can choose to develop things that currently you're not good at if you have awareness about it. Um, and that's been the foundation of Adam's success and, and kind of part of Paul's as well is like people can change if they know where their blind spots are and if they're coached towards challenging experiences. It's all about new experiences that put you into that. So that's why uh, Uncommon Success and Real Movement, very experiential based. People think I'm a lunatic for making people you know, juggle and do handstands and things like that. I just don't know how to get results with people who don't do those sorts of things. Like it, it works because people get that new perspective on their future. Mm -hmm. You could use other tools, but they're the ones that have worked for me and for a lot of people that, that I'm working with. Um, Is that so because on, there's a high amount of failure with those activities at the start? Yeah. So for me, so the, the red one, like in, in our system, red one is body composition. So it's, um, yeah, being able to get yourself to where you, you look athletic and, you, you know, you feel good when you look in the mirror. If you want to be a powerlifter and you want to be like heavyweight, then that's cool. But just be your ideal um, is kind of the red and the foundation. And, and I do think that is a good foundation for success. And not every successful person has ideal body composition, but those who have the discipline, like the ability to, to get themselves to that, in my experience, are going to be more successful especially if you're a coach, like it's much easier to be successful as a coach when you get your own body composition somewhere close to where you want it to be. 
Um, so the red one then is I am, uh, the blue one is I am free. The physical manifestation of that is with uh, juggling. So the, and there's different wealth manifestation and, and whatnot, but the juggling one is about um, wiring new patterns into the brain. And so with juggling, people think, oh, I could never do that you can actually learn it really fast. And it's it's not like three ball juggling is something that people can, if they're athletic and if they've done hand-eye coordination, boxing sort of sports, you, I can teach most people in a few minutes to be able to three ball juggle. If you've done only soccer or you haven't held balls for a long time, like elderly people or whatever, um, then it can be a longer journey, but everyone can learn to three ball juggle. G- generally doesn't take that long. Um, and then by, by the time you get to five, uh, in my experience, like everyone who's got to five has a different perspective on life by the time they get to five. And it's, you know, maybe it sounds like overhyped or whatever, but it's it's literally the experience that I've had. And there's, yeah, dozens of people who've got to the five ball. Um, I think it is because, yeah, you, you get used to practicing things, but there's a physiological aspect to it as well. Like you get used to the failure and all that sort of stuff, but there's a physiological aspect of like, it, it increases the density of the corpus callosum. So the left brain and the right brain are more connected and we need that if we're going to bring logical thinking and creative thinking together and a lot of people are overly dominant in one side and that connection is not that strong so you're actually working with better hardware uh, and better software if you become a five ball juggler versus not um right yeah so there's good research on it like people think i'm yeah i've been criticized a lot for that sort of stuff because it's not mainstream strength and conditioning if you look up the research on juggling like it's as mainstream science as you can find that says this really works. So like there's not much of a case for saying it doesn't do anything. There's only a case for thinking that your brain doesn't matter for sports, which is probably not a case that many people would want to make. Um, mm-hmm. Your brain probably does matter for sports and your hand-eye coordination probably does matter for sports. And yeah, like anyways. So the, the next level then is the orange. And in the orange, the manifestation is, the physical manifestation is handstands. Handstands goes, orange is more like entrepreneurial, blue is like more following rules. And so blue is about in wealth, it's like rules for wealth. So you've, everyone's understood the rules for poverty or they've not understood, but they've applied the rules for poverty because most people, the majority of people in the States, the US don't have $500 to meet immediate needs without going into debt or asking someone else to make. Like they don't have $500. The majority of people in the richest country in the world do not have access to $500 without, like they just, they don't have it on deck. So we're good at being programmed to have nothing, but we're not good at programming ourselves to be wealthy. So that, that's that's a programming thing um, of, of following rules. So there are rules for wealth, there are rules for poverty. You choose which ones you want to do. Fully on you. If you want to keep doing what you're doing, fine. If you want to follow rules for wealth, here they, you know, here they are. They're not mine. I'm just going to refer you to people who I've learned from who are much smarter than me. Orange then is uh, I am I am value. Uh, I'm valued and it's about like being entrepreneurial, which is in the hierarchy of things. It's more difficult than being able to run through the brick wall and being able to follow the rules to, to be uh, an achiever and to be uh, entrepreneurial in, in the, in the sporting sense, it's like going after it and winning where red would be like boxing where you just knock the other guy out. Um, Blue, I think, is more like uh, gymnastics and stuff where, like, there's the rules and you follow and it's points and that sort of stuff of, like, the criteria and such. And then orange is, like, where you, yeah, where you go, and, go and win. Green would be more like a team sport. Um, but anyways, the, the orange uh, physical manifestation is the handstand because business is much harder than people uh, give it credit for. They think, oh, I'm a personal trainer. If I put it in my bio, if I have a website... Uh, if I have a cool logo, like everything will be fine. Like, no, no, it won't be yeah. fine. Like it's D- DM me for online training and I'll just have a yeah, that works, on works business. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how you end up driving a Ferrari and like, living life on your own terms for sure. Mm. Uh, and not that most coaches want to have a Ferrari, but so the handstand is the physical manifestation of that where you have to be super persistent. People underestimate how difficult it is to have a 60 second handstand. If you get a 60 second handstand as an adult who didn't do gymnastics, I know that you have something about you, like you're someone who will persist through something that is uncomfortable and therefore you can have a business. Like you still need to learn the specific skills of business. I'm not saying that they're the same thing, but it's the traits. If you listen to Alex Hormozzi, he talks about skills, beliefs, traits. Okay, so what are your beliefs about yourself? When you do all this stuff, your beliefs about yourself, your ability to change, your ability to become who you need to be, 
start to shift. Um, I love the Joe Dispenza type stuff, but you know, it's, it's really clear with Hormozzi's system. Like he knows business, man. If you listen to Alex Hormozzi, yeah, he's awesome. He knows business. Like he knows, yeah. he definitely knows business. And he's saying that, you, you know, you got to develop your specific skills. A lot of those skills aren't even on the radar. I didn't even know what copywriting was until I started working with Paul. I literally, like I'd been in business for five years. I'd made millions of dollars. I did not know what copywriting was. Like I did not know what copywriting was. I'd done some sales training, but I, I literally didn't know what it was. Like I didn't know about the headlines. I didn't know about like templates and, and, and I'll, you know, because I was, I had results. Like I knew how to do what I was doing. I didn't need to know that stuff to be able to be successful to a certain level to be, go to another level. Like it's, it's definitely handy. Um, like, like you can see with Graham, like he's really good. He's really into the business side of things and people don't see that. They just see that like, he's good with feet as well. He's good with, you know, he's good at his technical stuff, but he's actually really, mm. and oftentimes people don't know what people have been through to be where they are. You know, that's mm. lifting the curtain a little bit, but the handstand is a great way to, to physically manifest that persistence. And even in yoga, in terms of like brain health and mental health, you're getting all that blood flow, fresh lymph, all that stuff. Like there's a physiological argument for inverting as well that has long historical roots, um, balance centers, all those sorts of things. It's not complete woo-woo. There is, you know, there is some stuff there physiologically that probably going to do good things. Um, and if you can persist through discomfort, it's not going to be comfortable. I think you can probably vouch for this. It's not comfortable all the time to be a personal trainer and to build a business in in uh in personal training, building any business, there's going to be some discomfort to endure, and you're going to have to do some things that you don't really want to do. It's not all yeah. rainbows and butterflies, right? And so the handstand is a bit like that, where it's cool to have and it's cool to be able to do, and it feels really good once you can do it. But to get there is like it's a bit like jamming your nuts in the door. Like it's not something you wake <laughs> yeah, up and yeah. really yeah. looking forward to. It. Learning yeah. to show up when you don't want to. That's um that's a big yeah. skill that you yeah handstands will teach you that and businesses that's what you need to do is not just show up every day regardless yeah and if you don't if you're not consistent with handstands we know because you just don't get better unless you do them like pretty much every day you have to be pretty sharp about how you go about it as well people kind of just think they'll wing it and they'll do some every now and then and they won't really follow any kind of technique that person usually two years later they're almost exactly where they were you know to mm -hmm. before so you need to like you need to have a system you need like that's what happens with orange and so that's the orange green is then coaching other people to do this stuff so green is i am connected and the, a huge error for the average male is to think like i'm going to do this on my own nobody does it on their own mm -hmm. nobody's ever done it on their own historically no one's ever done it on their own Apparently there is one person who went like one Olympic, an Olympic medal or Olympic gold who was like self-coached, but I'm pretty sure if you look into it, they would have been training with all sorts of people. They had this coach, they had that coach, they're training that squad. Um, I haven't researched that. I need to research it because I, I put up one day and someone, like a few people came up with like one person who was self-coached. Everybody else had been part of a squad. They had a coach. Everything was in their favor to win. Every massive scientific discovery you know, when you look at Einstein's history, if you read his, his stories, he was sending letters everywhere. He was traveling. If you look at Jesus's history, you know, his 12 disciples, there's all versions of his personal history that he traveled here and he lived there in the years that are in the Bible. There's no case that I've found of anyone doing anything of any value who wasn't in, in collaboration with other people. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily like employees or staff members or whatever, but everybody wins through being connected and, and we know this through the, the things of you know you're the product of the five people you spend the most time mm. with and these kind of cliches but very few people take it literally so i'm connected is like really acknowledging that that side of things and, and it's about being good at relationships as well um which to be honest in my graph the green is not the strongest I'm not that lovey-dovey coach i had trouble dealing with athletes who weren't like achiever run through the brick wall I didn't really get the greener type athlete. And that's, you know, why I'm starting to work with Adam is to be able to be more well-rounded so that I can access more of the, the yellow. So the green is literally like help someone else do the Uncom 25, which is 25 days of consecutively building something that you want to build, whether it's in, you know, any, whichever color it's in. So then green is like 
helping other people to do it. And you need to have done it yourself and then you can help other people to do it. And that's super rewarding as well. Um, and then the yellow uh, is like uh, squat every day or, or snatch. So to be honest, like I don't really know what the best yellow manifestation is physically, but um, that stuff is kind of, the snatch is like the ultimate lift. Uh, so I kind of like it as the yellow level thing, but imposing yellow on people, uh, imposing the snatch on everyone is like, doesn't make much sense because it's so hard, like skill wise and mobility wise. Mm -hmm. So kind of got squat every day in there is like a, a yellow option as well. Um, and this is, I guess, also a bit like <laughs> the post that I got blown up for, but, you know, take like taking ownership of the world and taking like more responsibility on for, uh, you know, having a positive impact on the world is, is the yellow is someone who's able to operate from all of these four really well and move fluidly between them and identify what profile other people are operating from in, in business and in training and whatever. And they're able to move fluidly and you can't really tell which one they are because they're able to use all of them. Uh, really well so this is this is yellow and yellow are the people who can innovate and, and kind of change the world so after people have had massive success in business and they're really good at building relationships and mending relationships and having teams then they tend to start thinking about okay well if we can do whatever we want then what would i do kind of thing and this came out for ben patrick on the joe rogan podcast i'd been talking about like i want one of my students to become rogan ready to get on the joe rogan podcast for about two three years maybe Ben Patrick's on the Rogan podcast and they start talking about like the problems of the education system. And, and then a, a week or two later, Ben puts up a blog post of like, you know, this is what I'm going to do in terms of building a new education for, for my children. And it's going to be available online and there's going to be a physical school. And that's like getting to yellow where, because you were able mm. to do what you wanted to do in all of these areas, then you can start to think about this. And Nico, Nico Di Paoli is doing it as well because he's building this village uh, in, in Bali where you're starting to think about, okay, well, how could I set up a model that shows other people, you know, how to, how to kind of live better on a, on a different level. And that's, I guess my new thing now is uh, rather than gyms, I'd, I'd like to help people to have these kind of uncommon success locations where people can um, develop in, in sort of each and all of the areas and go to physical locations where they can do those sorts of things. That's the, that's one of the manifestations that could come out of being successful in, in my program. It's not anyone can do whatever they want, use the tools for whatever makes sense to them. But I think this is going to happen where we like to set up these physical locations all around the world that anyone can go to a local place or fly to somewhere else in the world and go there for 25 days or five days and like reset and think bigger and, be, you know go through the education with dedication and with support around them and things like that so this is i guess my yellow vision of how we can do something that's more important than gyms gyms are super important to me that, that this like this new concept is like the next uh, generation of that concept that i've been working on for since 2014 sort of i started working with gym owners yeah it's very interesting mate like i work completely online now <laughs> I lived overseas for eight years, two years in Asia, six years in Australia, and then I moved home um, just before Christmas and I'm, I'm traveling around Europe now. But like for me now, the big thing is sense of community, which becomes very difficult when you're moving a lot. So these kind of you see a lot of like co-living, co-working spaces is kind of a big thing that's growing. What you're talking about sounds like the next the next step of that, like a, an actual, you know, specifically for you know, health, fitness, um, you know, wealth, all these things. Um, but with regards to moving, you moved, um, was it two years ago you decided to leave Australia? Yeah, we, I, I left with the plan of not ever living there again. Uh, in to the, uh, I think it was the last month, the end of 2019. Started 2020, like, yeah, maybe it was January. It was January 2020 is when we uh, left with the, the intention of not returning. So just over two years. And that was kind of all around the the mortgage, you know, getting the wealth and everything like that. Um, do you want to maybe talk about the move or is that somewhere you want to stay long term with regards to like you're in Eastern Europe now, right? 
the financial part was definitely part of the motivation. Uh, it was also the fact I never planned to live in Australia again after I left at 21. I never felt mm -hmm. like it was home. I didn't want it to be home. I, I think a lot of people who travel a lot can sometimes get that rejection of their home country. It's a beautiful country and it's full of beautiful people. I understand why people from all over the world dream of living there. Like the wages are high, the quality of life is, is high. Um, the reputation's been tarnished a little over the last two years, it's probably fair to say, uh, mm. with some of the, the ways things went. And that's where you can see like a really blue dominant culture uh, come out where more, more red, orange culture wouldn't have what happened in Australia. So like that was actually the Gravesian model was a way to understand like the apartheid and things like that. So it works really on a, on a, on a country level as well as uh, culturally, as well as on a sporting level or a business level. You can look at it through different lenses. But um, yeah, like it was, it was partly a business decision. Like I'd been making all my money online for uh, since 2014. Like a, so when you're paying like 50, 60, 70% tax, um, by the time you do the math on all the all the tax that you're paying, like what value are you getting for that? I didn't really love the school system. I wasn't really using like any of the health services and things that are draining a lot of the money. Um, and I just thought, well, why don't I try, why don't I try something else? Because I'm, I'm under financial stress here. It's not helping me live my best life. I don't actually love this, you know, this system. I don't really necessarily agree with a lot of the military spending and stuff as well. Like, why don't I just try something else? And so the plan was to move to Costa Rica. Um, and it, it turns out that international tax laws are quite funny. Like Australia doesn't tax you. If you move out permanently and you're not coming back, then you don't pay tax in Australia. America and a couple of other countries are the only ones that have like global taxation. But it's, le it's a legal thing to say like, I'm no longer going to live there. Don't tax me anymore. And they, and they want to know where you live and they want to know that you're not coming back. And if you do that, like you have to be really strict with it for Australia. Every country has its own rules but if it's clear that you're out and you're not coming back then you're out of the Australian tax system then some countries don't care about foreign earned income right so Costa Rica has a policy at the moment and they think about changing it but they have a policy where you can live there 12 months of the year be a resident and they'll only tax the money that you make in Costa Rica so if I moved to Costa Rica I wouldn't necessarily make any money domestically but if I did you know if I ran some personal training or something I'd pay tax on that under their system and I would pay zero tax on anything that I learned earn online outside of that country. So fine, that makes sense. What about business tax? That would be personal. Well, it turns out that America doesn't tax foreign earned uh, income through their LLCs. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that that was the case, but you can also Hong Kong as well. So like the, some of the biggest economies, like the one next to China and, and the US, they don't tax, uh, they only tax income that you earn within that country. So if I was to, go there and do stuff like this specific criteria about how it works but you can have an L a us llc or a hong kong or and and you don't get taxed on that so there's literally like you follow the rules of two different places and you you have zero tax obligation i didn't know that the world worked like that until i started researching it in, in 2019 and then there's things like dubai with its you know uh, zero tax and just pay a few you pay fees admin fees and whatnot um, there's all these different possibilities that I wasn't aware of, but then once I was aware of it, I didn't really want to be living in Australia anyway. I wanted to go and learn other languages. I wanted to go travel more. I didn't know what was going to happen just after 2020, uh, the start of 2020. Like I was planning to to to, to do laps of the world for for the next you know foreseeable future because um, I love those live events and stuff that I've done. Like that's always been a core part of the business, like four day live events. But yeah, so when uh, that was that's kind of the, the story is like the rules there's literally like i felt almost like a criminal thinking about it and researching it mm -hmm. and i like that stuff is like so built in and it's part of like being being poor and being having it built in like to be poor because how did how do most people in the richest country in the world not have 500 dollars? like it's so easy to make 500 dollars in the united states and most people don't have it like so obviously something's going on here and the feeling that you have about tax of like, oh, if you're not paying tons of tax and you're a bad person, like you can always send money in taxes to whichever country. I'm sure they're going to accept it. Like if you just say, hey, this is a donation to your government, do whatever you want with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 
it's uh, it's something that each individual should consider, like where, where you pay tax, why you pay tax, what you're actually contributing to, are your values in alignment with what you're paying for, what you're paying to. And it's something for everyone to work out. I'm not saying everyone should be, you know, one or 2% tax. You've got to pay taxes no matter what. You're going to pay some tax. Um, mm-hmm. But it's up to each individual to choose uh, what works, what makes sense for them. If it makes sense to live in France and pay, you know, the highest, whatever the, the taxes are, Australia, cool, do it. But it's not a, the worst thing to actually understand how the rules work and consider the possibility of having an online business, of being an entrepreneur, and, you know, looking at other ways. Even if you were, were to do it for 10 years, so you could just become wealthy and then, you know, go back and live in a high tax country if you want to do it from a position of wealth rather than, uh, where, where most are operating from. There's a real opportunity for this at the moment. Um, looking into um, Balaji Srinivasan, his work, he's been on the uh, Tim Ferriss podcast and a bunch of other ones. I think Sam oh, Harris. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's yeah, phenomenal. So uh, he's saying that startup cities are the next, you know, if, if crypto was like the boom thing to get into in the like 2010 to 2015, um, then he's saying startup cities are like that thing right now. And so that's kind of what we're doing in a way with, uh, you know, without really setting out as a business thing, but like that's what we're setting up, like where it's an ideal location where you might come and say you want to stay in Montenegro at a location here, stay for a month, train well, mastermind on your business. Um, but, yeah, setting this up in a way that's uh, like – in that niche of people who are into health and fitness, into entrepreneurship, there's there's a market for it. It's not the biggest market, but there's there's a market for it. And I think that's what we're setting ourselves up to be able to sort of participate in. It's not even like from a business perspective of like, we're gonna charge you a ton of money to come. It's more so that it will help to sell these $100 a year memberships that I sell now. Like Uncommon Success is $100 a year. You get access to all the stuff that, uh, we've Such been talking value, by the way like it's yeah ridiculous man uh so I'm not just saying that because you're on the call but it's it's there's so much value in that so yeah, i strongly recommend anyone listening to to check it out i'm i'm doing everything i can to make it the most valuable thing where like i used to charge ten thousand dollars a year i could work with you know 50 sort of people um that was cool as well as a business model but now it's like i've achieved more than i thought i would ever achieve like how can i see if i can help people who are not on track for anything that they want to experience or anything close to what they could experience. Like how can I help my 20 year old self? I started reading rich dad, poor dad, and I bought some shares and stuff when I was 19, 20, like my first job, pool lifeguard had almost no money. How do I help that kid be able to, you know, that young man, what would, if I'd have shown him what, you know, would I have had a better experience sooner and the way that sort of Nico's had and people that I've worked with one-to-one, there, there are a bunch of them who've done really, really good things. But how could I, how can I make this available to people for two dollars a week, and, and and see if we can make it work like that? Like that's that's the challenge that I've sort of set myself now. The physical locations are almost like trying to make the bonuses so good for being part of this hundred dollar thing, where like because you're part of this, you know, you can if there's vacancy, you can go and hang out, or there's going to be this event on that you can go to, or like trying to sweeten the deal for the for the online thing is is almost where it's coming from like not really planning on the locations actually making money uh, but they could end up being really good businesses in themselves and if we can inspire more people to start things like that there's 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 a guy in Tunisia that's interested in doing one there's one in Germany like we sort of already got three that are pretty much on the map and then if we can mastermind and support and then have this huge online community of, you know, we're, we're growing at a rate where we're going to have thousands of members within the next couple of years. Hopefully it happens sooner than that. Um, by the time there's thousands of members, if you've got a few of these locations and everyone's making money online, then it's going to be easy to fill the location with our members, but then also with people like in an Airbnb, booking.com kind of sense, because you've got this network effect around the locations where, you know, they've, they've got, They've got good reviews, they've got good facilities, they've got like a service that they can offer that other people don't offer. So um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. It's probably really only become a focus and and clearly like a business thing in the last week or two. We've been working on Vanuatu for for maybe six, eight months um, as like an uncom village with its own food supply. So it's fully like self-sustaining. 
cattle, uh, fruit production, all that stuff is wow. is on site. A hundred, it's a hundred hectare site, and it's got beachfront as well to have something like the Tulum kind of gym without the ruckus that goes on in in uh, Tulum. I don't know if you've seen that gym, like mm. the beach side or the wooden weights. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's like part of the vision is to have that kind of stuff and have a court, a pool. Um, but then, yeah, with the with the full food supply, I'm super passionate about regenerative agriculture. I had like 40 animals on my farm there at one stage. Uh, mm. The one that I bought in Australia, um, goats and pigs and ducks and geese and chickens. And and uh, I, I want to do that stuff again. And I want to have, uh, you know, f- autonomy around quality food is something that I value really highly. Like I've had similar experiences with health and food like yourself. So, mm. uh, yeah, how can we bring all this stuff together? There are so many people who have these values, like personal development, being really strong, um, being you know independent in terms, and, and you know, having a great business. There are a lot of people with these values. So I think that for this hundred dollar year product, that if I can get it in front of a few people, uh, then it might go somewhere. I actually, feel I finally feel like I have something that's worth going on during because I've been talking for a while of like. Um, helping other people to get to the point where they're like you know rogan ready this is like a kind of a slogan thing it's, it's kind of cheap and whatever I, I know i come up with those sorts of things sometimes but now i finally feel as though like this would be a huge service if if the world knew about this thing i need to execute further and and, and things before uh before joe's likely to give me a tap on the shoulder and i know he hates people calling calling out like hey put me on your show so you know i'm probably not doing myself any favors by mentioning it but um I, I feel like this is a concept that like 80% of his audience would be like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, this is the thing yeah, I've been looking definitely. for. It's going to be a lot of guys would be yeah, massively into that. I think it's definitely like I was saying to you about the co living, co working. Like, have you heard of Bankso in Bulgaria? I've heard of it. I, I, I haven't looked it up. I've, I've looked up a few of the ones that um, mm. Balaji talks about. But yeah, tell me more about it. Bank, so it's, it's basically just a little ski village and this German guy, Matthias something, he started a co-working space there probably four or five years ago, but now it's actually one of, if not the top co-working destination in Europe. Um, so he's just kind of, you know, there's nothing there. It's just a, a, a play, like it's a winter destination for skiing, but just it's turned into like a destination for people to go to network for, you know, online d- digital nomad, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I can definitely see like more and more of these kind of destinations are going to become more of a thing, I think, in the future as well, going forwards with regards to what you're doing as well, creating these destinations. Such a smart thing. Like there's so many villages that are relatively abandoned in the country because everyone needs to be in the city to make ends meet, especially in lower income mm-hmm. countries. Bulgaria, the average wage is not super high. Everyone moves to the city. You move to a, a beautiful spot in the country and bring your friends. The problem is you need to bring your friends. Like that's what's most important is the network effect. Mm-hmm. So we can add, if we are tens of thousands, any land that we buy in any country is going to become much more valuable. So you could buy like you could buy anything anywhere and turn it into something nice because you've got access to funding through through the community. You can raise money really quickly with you know NFTs and different projects, different offers if you've got funding, like you need to look up a project, people need to look up a project called Oz, Oz Finance. Uh, if you understand the Oz Finance model and, and what they're bringing to the world, it's a Philippines-based project that is, it's like doing what we're talking about, but like on a bigger scale with the support of the Filipino government. Filipino government's basically said, we want people to come here who... Uh, are into blockchain and crypto because it turns out that people who are into blockchain and crypto inject a lot of money into the local economy wherever they go. Like they're apparently the highest, even more so than entrepreneurs, like they're the people that you want in your country, like per, you know, for the amount of money that they spend, right? So Philippines makes a lot of money through casinos and things like that. What if they made money through um, bringing the most, you know, the people, the most sought after people to integrate into your economy? So how can they bring them? Well, they've set up this zero tax residency where all you need to do is buy $100,000 worth of a certain token, well, this OS Finance token, TOTOS, and then you can get zero tax for, for five years. And they they have some of the most 
like secretive banking. It's very difficult to get behind the corporate veil and the, the personal finance veil. So they're only bringing in people who have clean criminal records and such, but there are a lot of people in the world at the moment who are considering like, well, what just happened in Canada? Is that going to happen in my country? Is it going to happen again in Canada? Like who's going to lock up what bank accounts for what, you know, for what offence um, is, is something that anyone with wealth has to consider. And so, you know, this token is a way to get yourself tax-free residency for five years, potentially longer. There are only 480 places within this Philippines project, but then they're looking to set up in the eco zones around the world. At the end of the five years or whenever you want, you can unstake your tokens and then sell your tokens. So if the project fails, then your tokens will be worth nothing. And that's the risk in crypto. But you still get the tax-free residency that the Filipino government has, has agreed to. So if that's worth more than $100,000 to you, then happy days. If the token value happens to, if instead of being 480 people who want to go there, if it's 4,800 people or 48,000 people who want zero tax out of the 58 million millionaires in the world that there are today, if there's for, you know 48,000 who decide they want that, then you make 100x. So you, you, you 10, your 100,000 becomes $10 million worth of tokens, which has happened for a lot of people in the crypto world when they bought Bitcoin or they bought Ethereum in 2013. My neighbor here, um, had an exchange, ran an exchange in Slovenia. He bought crypto in the very early stages, in his 20s, super wealthy. It happens to real people. Like it's not that, it just, it, it has happened. It's a zero dollar industry that went to 3 trillion. You can't do that without some people becoming wealthy. And the exchanges generally become most wealthy because people jump in and out of things and they don't understand um, you know, how it works, how they're being gamified to sort of donate their money to the wealthy people in crypto. But um, this is literally happening. So if you if you look at that project and you understand, as as that person with that hundred thousand uh, tokens, hundred thousand dollars worth of those tokens, you also become an owner in the DAO, which is the decentralized autonomous organization. You own effectively shares in everything that's being developed on that land. Now, because there's forty eight million dollars worth of investor money in that area, and the crypto people have, have made a commitment to it then infrastructure companies and anyone like people are willing to invest. They've already raised billions of dollars in finance for a bridge uh, and for you know, housing and stuff in this zone of Bataan. But it's because there's so much money in these people that it makes sense to invest in infrastructure. So all we need is our community to be really strong and have a bunch of people there and people are going to want to finance it. <laughs> like I want to finance it. If I can finance it all myself, I'll finance, you know, as many locations as I can because this is my dream and this is like where people can thrive and people can, can do really great things. But it could also become a really viable business model where it's like, of course, I'm going to fund this thing. Like, look at the returns that they're getting because people like you come and stay. and It's not super expensive, but like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, like a, a local decentralized version of that, that sort of model. And so, yeah becoming really passionate about crypto, looking at how all these different projects work, how, how are these NFT projects working? How's this working? How's that working? That's given me a new perspective on, okay, like how does, you know, how is this going to look 10 years from now? Okay, let's do it now. You know, that's what I'm trying to do with Uncommon Success. And then that introduces you as an Uncommon Success member because you're seeing like, what's he doing with all this stuff? So many people mm -hmm. have bought their first NFT through me. They've bought their first um, cryptocurrency. And, you know, the market's not great at the moment, et cetera. But the thing is, like, you're looking at the future when a lot of other people are looking at the past or they're looking at, you know, they're, they're too scared to look at it. It's too confusing. It takes too much attention. I understand. I ignored it until 2019. But when I decided yeah. to become wealthy, then I was like, okay, well, I need to understand what Bitcoin is. And then a couple of hundred hours later, don't feel like such a fool um, when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I went in a bunch of different directions there, but the... The nomad, um, the digital nomad stuff is, is is super exciting, and if we can add a lot more meaning to it through having common ground and having like real buy-in with the training and the quality of food and sourcing things, like that stuff's a huge hassle as well, right? If you're going to be a digital nomad, like yeah. it's very difficult. Good quality food, um, the social the social side, as you say. So community, yeah, exactly. Like community is the big thing because like being back home in Ireland was amazing to be around all my friends. But then you know traveling is exciting, but you want to have a network or some sort of a base as well. You know that's the thing. The downside of traveling is you're 
you've no stability a lot of the time. So I think these communities are, that's what people are going to be craving more and more as more and more people are going uh, online, working online, having the ability to be remote. I think you're going to feel at home in any of the locations. And if you're you know, having permanent, having like your own dwelling there could be an option as well, or it could be that you own it mm-hmm. and you can rent it out to other people in the community. If you want to front up for the infrastructure and things like that, if you think, okay, yeah, well, I can see this being rented out. I want to buy one, it's 10 grand here in Montenegro to build like a tiny house. Seems Mm -hmm. like a relatively fine investment versus spending what I spent in Australia to be part of, you know, um, the numbers numbers are interesting for sure. Like in Chris, a $10,000 house inside of a business hub where you've got your ideal training environment and super smart people go, like what's that worth? Versus like no one cares about the accommodation. They care about the people that they're going to meet when they get there. So um there's there's a chance that places that are that land that's worth not much becomes worth a lot because of the human capital that goes on top and that's the way that oz finance talks about it's like you put a software layer on top of the land the land's worth x but then you layer on this the software you layer on the people and the land's worth y or the land's worth 10x or 100x or you know that's that's what's um potentially from a business perspective the orange you know putting the orange hat on but it's like, mm. it's the dream, it's the ideal, it's the way the world could, would, should be potentially like. Yeah, we're getting deep. it's very, no, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm conscious of your time, mate, because we have gone over. Are you okay to chat a bit longer or do you want to start wrapping things talk, up? Talk, I can talk all day about this stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm asking ask you the same question. But no, oh, it's, yeah, it's no, no. Yeah, I think crypto, we can keep, chatting about this like one, one thing i found really interesting that i'd like to maybe hear your thoughts on as well as around and i can't remember who was saying it but there's basically saying like nfts and i don't know a lot about nfts i've just gotten you know started the do- dollar cost averaging into you know bitcoin ethereum over the last kind of 12 months um but they were saying nfts will allow it will potentially create a second renaissance with art because you'll have you'll almost free a lot of people who in the past would have had to go into a regular job to make money. And then with the NFT option, they will potentially be funded and be able to actually put their time and money or time and energy into, into creating new like art, whether it's digital or, or, or physical. So do you have any, uh, you know, thoughts about NFTs or anything you want to riff on? Lots of thoughts on NFTs that, that could well happen because of the funding that's going towards art. But I think it's the least interesting application of NFTs. I think the art side has been like the biggest distraction that's prevented people from understanding what the real renaissance could, which should be with, with NFTs. I think if you want to understand the renaissance that NFTs could bring, um, then understanding like the, the Gary V project is maybe the best one to understand, like V Friends and the value that he's put into his NFTs. It's got these little squiggle drawings, which are kind of cool because Gary did them, but like the art is, the art is nothing. It's a ticket to his events, um, his, his VCon or whatever it is over the next few years. Plus there's a bunch of other things that are built into the different NFTs. It's not about the art. It's about changing the way seed funding's done, share distribution, like dividends is done. Um, giving your, like it's, everything becomes community owned, cost, like customer owned, like, Uncom is, is going to be fully decentralized. You know, within a few years, it will make zero difference whether I'm there or not. Um, and the Web3 technology, this, this you know, the NFT layer, the social to- like the, the token that goes with the Uncom community is how and why it can work like that. Decentralized governance as well. Um, this stuff is, is going to explode over the next few years, like of having self-governing uh, communities, it's, it's super interesting. Balaji Srinivasan is, is a good one to get into. He, he goes deep. It's, it's hard to keep up with him in his podcasts, but it's well worth it. I've, pre, I've listened to everything I can find. I didn't subscribe to Sam Harris's one. That's the only thing that you have to pay to listen to the full episode with him. And I haven't mm-hmm. done that because I've been a huge um, listener of Sam Harris's. He does great work. But, mm-hmm. but other than that, I've pretty much listened to everything that Balaji said over the last four or five years. Um, and that's what I tend to do when I get into something is like I tend to go quite deep and uh, yeah so NFTs 
Now, at the moment, with, in terms of regulation, you can't do all those things. You can't say it's like a share in the company. You can't say that I'm going to give you a dividend and, and all of those sorts of things because the regulation says that you're a bad person if you do that sort of stuff, whatever it is. Like, it's not clear from a regulatory perspective in the United States, like where these things fit, but it's clear that they have this use case and it seems like almost impossible that it's not going to become uh, like the way forward. Like they kind of have to send it into a dark age for this stuff not to not to come to light because it's just so much better from once you understand the way it works. Like it just looks like, yeah, this is what my business needs. Like every personal trainer in terms of compliance and things like that, like everyone is going to want this stuff. Once it's simple of like, people won't necessarily know that it is an NFT or that it's built on Web3 in the same way that you don't understand how electricity works or you don't necessarily understand the back end of your website and all the coding that went into it. It could be, it might well end up being exactly the same with all this NFT, you know, Web3 stuff. But what you will know is that now you get better results. Now you have more customer loyalty. Now you have customers that like speak up more for your brand because they're shareholders like they... And effectively, when you own an NFT, you are effectively like a shareholder, depending on how it's all structured and such. But that's what, that's part of the reason why there's so much like virality about some of the key ones. Now, what's going to happen with the regulation? How long is it going to take? I don't know. Um, you know, it's world politics. It's a lot of stuff that's like beyond me to, to understand. But what the Filipino, you know, Oz Finance is offering is regulatory protection uh, as well as, um, tax, you know, incentive, um, and 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 a higher degree of privacy than than what you generally get. So, projects like the Oz Finance, like that's part of the reason why I'm so excited about it, is because that can potentially allow people to innovate in this space without being scared that they're going to get attacked by the U.S. government. I don't know the politics. Like, I'm not an international law expert either, but it seems as though like these projects need to kind of exist and develop that will guide like the bigger, slower moving organizations. It's not the U S government's bad. It's just that it's laws were designed before the internet. And so it's like, everything's mm. broken and how do you unbreak it? Well, it's not for, you know, the world's dominant economy and such. So um, yeah, the, I, I do believe everybody's, you know, a lot of businesses, uh, especially online businesses and people with their own apps and communities and such, it's going to all have this Web3 disruption. We may as well learn about it now and participate in it earlier on. And then some people will be potentially the next, you know, with Web2, it was Uber, it was Airbnb. Um, these are Web2 applications where the, the software layer allowed people to add more value to their physical space, you know, um, or their car. So the software layer added more value to, to the hardware. That's about to happen with uh, online education and video content and things like that. Like the software layer is going to add more value to the stuff that you've created. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very exciting. And I want people who want to learn about it to have people to talk to about it. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, I've got no one to talk to about, you know, to this, talk about this stuff with. And so, uh, yeah, if I can facilitate that, if I can start the conversation, if I can have the conversation, I'm, I'm not a tech expert. I'm a balding strength coach who wants to <laughs> do, do my best. Um, so I, 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 I want to be corrected. I want to be able to have the conversation. I want to be sent links. I want my friends to be into this stuff so that, you know, we can, we can do good things. I can go, I've gone out and found crypto friends as well. I've bought my way into a few crypto societies through NFTs. Like I'm, mm. I'm part of the top level in a, in a few different communities because I've bought a bunch of them. And that means I get access to those people and there's some good people there. And that, like I have built some really good connections at the same time. They're not my people in a way, like there might be one or two of them that are into their training and care about their food. But then there's a lot of them that I know if we hang out, it's, we're not going to be hanging out for that long. Like I might go and drink with them and eat junk food for one, one day or night just to be flexible in my own mind. Um, that's a challenge for me to actually break my own rules and, and uh, my own trends. But yeah, those, uh, I want to bring my community to that stuff as well as like interact with that community that, that people who already get it, who already made their millions um, in that realm. Yeah. I think that's, well, it's an interesting point because, regardless of where you're at on the knowledge base 
you can put it into layman's terms for people that are going to understand what you're saying better than someone who's maybe a real tech focused person, you know, so you can uh, put it in layman's terms to personal trainers, coaches, and we can kind of digest it a lot easier than, you know, downloading a podcast and going super deep into the weeds about everything. And it's just kind of going over people's heads as well. So yeah, I think it's just finding out who's the people who's going to be most receptive to, to what you're trying to share as well. And everyone's got that in some way. I think that's important concept, Connor, that to generalize and universalize is that you're the best person to teach someone about something that you don't even know that much about. So mm. it's a funny thing to consider, but the world's best expert in carnival diet is probably not the person that's going to help your friends to get started on it. Cause you've got that story. They trust you. They know you. They've seen what's happened to you. They've seen, you know, they know you, you might want to share something that's happened with you. You know, what your relatives said about your father, like that stuff is, is really, really powerful. You don't have to be the world expert. You just need to be the person who's in the best location proximity to the, to the person who's looking for a solution. And so Balaji Srinivasan is a million times smarter. He's a Stanford PhD. He's got all this stuff on the tip of his tongue. It's just like brain breaking to, to listen to him and try and comprehend, try and keep up with him, concentrate yeah. so hard. But he's not the one for everybody. Like some people who listen to his podcast will go and check out his stuff and just be like, you know, that's that's yeah. too far. I'll just listen yeah. to Keegan's yeah. book and just, you know, I'll find some other people who are more at the strength coach level. Um, so yeah, that's if if I have an ability, maybe sometimes it's sometimes it is that to introduce new concepts in a way that and gets other people to the point of action where other content may not have got them to the point of action. As, as quickly and ideally this podcast will be that for a couple of people and a couple of people dm me and say like listen to the podcast and i took x action if that happens then you know the world's a better place or at least people are taking on new experiences that might make things better and if they do the stuff that i'm saying like the handstand and they're like oh no it's crap and i made my life worse they get to a 60 second handstand in the next two years and they say no nah, didn't work like i it didn't uh, nothing's better i'm no in no way improved my life then Fair enough, but um, I think it's, it's about having those experiences and experiments and uh, everyone, yeah, everyone's in a position to lead somebody. The worse position you've been in and then the better it is in some ways, like the, the more uh, accessible person who's just lost 10 kilos but still got another 30 to lose might be better at helping someone who's morbidly obese to, to get started than I am because mm. they might not identify with me. I might not be able to get through to them. So mm -hmm. it's... Um, We've all got a role to play. And I think that's that's one of the key things that I've been saying all the way through, you know, with real movement and, and now with Uncom is like play your role as best you can because no one else is going to play that role. And you might think, well, Joe Rogan's got podcasting covered, but he doesn't because one person might listen to this podcast that and it changes their life for better. You know what I mean? So mm. everyone's got their role to play. Like ideally, this podcast gets the same viewership as, as Rogan's, but probably unlikely maybe. You know? uh, maybe we'll see man we'll see how we go <laughs> but you know what i'm saying like yeah people are empowered by their beliefs of like oh it doesn't matter what i do what difference can i make well no you can make a difference we're all super connected now like i've got one degree of separation to to joe rogan to um other other big names like ben ben patrick's a good friend of mine we typically speak all the time he, he knows Joe, um, you know, Graham's practically living with Mark Bell, who's the most influential podcast in fitness, I think, or at least the, mm. you know, legit one. Like there's not much separation there. All I need to have is a really good concept. So if you're a friend of mine and I'm a friend of them, then there's no separation now. The only challenge is become valuable, like do stuff that's really good, like whether that's with your training, whether that's with your business, your, your, your idea, if it's not doing really well, then it's probably not that good. Like that's, that's the hard truth of it. And that's the truth that I have to face of like, I'm called just past 200 members of active, active subscribers uh, on the $97 a year. Like that's the hard truth. It's obviously not that good yet. So I just keep working, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's the game. Um, and I'll just keep giving value and doing, you know, doing free calls and doing podcasts. And that's the game for all of us. If it's good enough, <clears throat> the world will find you like, 100% in 2022, if it's good enough, 
the, the world will find you. If you're not being found, then it's not good enough yet. The messaging isn't good enough. Like marketing is a real thing. The, the mm-hmm. product isn't good enough. It doesn't get good enough results. Like that's the world will find you if it's good enough. And maybe it takes a little while, but it's not. It doesn't take that long these days. If you look at what ATG did when I first spoke to Ben Patrick, he had 50 members. Uh, I think he had about 5,000 followers, and you know, he he was you know he wasn't he wasn't the Ben Patrick that that he is today uh, in terms of the impact that he was having in terms of his knowledge of marketing and all that sort of stuff. He could see that I took it more seriously than most trainers, but then mm-hmm. he took it like 10 times more seriously than me and executed on like online marketing and, you know, and he's been a real student of that game and he's, he's great at, you know, the content that he creates. He's crushed YouTube, he's crushed Instagram. Um, everything that he does, he, he works to be the best app and have the best, mm-hmm. you know, the best fitness app. His new app's about to come out. Um, that's really challenging to me, like to have a friend who's like that, who's gone from like, didn't have much of a following, didn't have much of a program to like, he's now, you know, 20, 50, 100 times bigger than me. Um, that challenges me. I'm okay, like, you know, do something good, you know, build build something valuable. And so I continue, you know, I'm part of ATG for coaches. I'll be an ATG supporter forever because it's it's the, the system that finally put on the map a, a way to train athletically that that really works for a lot of people and the principles are there and it it's it's amazing um, and I, I also need to get my own music out into the world in a way like the what what i'm offering with uncommon success it's it's uh it's different it's it's not making me a, a ton of money at the moment it's a tiny little thing but it's like everything to me like it's it's what i need to do it's what i know is right um uh, in my heart like it's more than anything i've built in the past like this is my purpose and what I'm meant to be doing. And I needed to leave behind real movement, which was more of a fitness-based brand because I was starting to talk about money and stuff there and people felt really uncomfortable with it because it wasn't what they were sold, you know? Mm-hmm. So some people are still angry at me for stopping that because it was like, it was, it was powerful for them and life-changing and it was powerful for me as well. And I had so many great friends and experiences, but I needed to shed that skin and start again. Um, and yes, yeah, starting a new brand from zero, like new Instagram account. Um, mm. It's tough. And, you know, you go back to like, yeah, you feel like a rookie and you got to make it work. But uh, it's if, if you know that that's what you need to do, if you know that that's the right thing, then I think, uh, I think it's still better to do it rather than do the smart business thing and stick with, you know, what you've been making money from, which was, you know, for me, it was real movement. Like I just didn't feel like it was the right thing to do to, uh, to stick with, with that at the position that I was in. And I had the opportunity to work with ATG for coaches. Um, I, I'd set the target years before of, I want to change the way the world trains. Like I was looking at commercial gyms. I'd go into a commercial gym and I'd be like, this is disgusting. Like, this is not, this is not cool. Like why the hell, why people are coming here and I can see why they don't come very often. Like the gym model is built around people not turning up for starters. Like, so most yeah. of the money made in gyms is like you sell 20 times more memberships than you have people use your gym, which is crap from the start. Like they, they actually don't want people to come. And then all the people who do come, a lot of them are getting a fraction of the results that they could get because nobody knows anything about training and nutrition. Like it's how you make your body work is the, one of the things that humanity is most ignorant about. So, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to help to kind of solve. And I thought I was going to do it with real movement, but it turned out that, you know, ATG was a much better vehicle. Like I could already see, well, it's already, you know, it's on this trajectory. Like why don't I help Ben have a coach's community behind what he's doing? And I think him having a coach's community has been really valuable for the support and the challenges that he's had uh, with product development and with, you know, negativity towards what he's doing and stuff like having hundreds of coaches who are behind you, who are knowledgeable people, um, I think is, is really powerful. Everybody needs that support network behind them or would do better with it behind them. So that's part of, you know, part of what we're doing with the uncommon success. But um, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the situation that, that I'm in, you know, right now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I would encourage other coaches and people to continue to reinvent themselves and not be boxed in by what you think other people's expectations are of what conversations you're allowed to have and what conversations you're not allowed to have because you're going to upset people like Mm -hmm. yeah you're definitely talking about a lot of stuff i guess that's probably well that i'm i'm guessing that's why you've been so successful is you're you're kind of seeing the trajectory of things and you're moving 
before you get there or before things get there. Um, so how do you deal with negativity or people being like you've, you know, you've got, you've lost it and, you know, two years time, you're right, or maybe three years time, but you're kind of weird in the moment. So how do you deal with that kind of maybe uncertainty around what you're putting your, your brand or your voice behind? Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard, man. Like it's, it's tough when, you know, recently I was called out as like a, basically like a scammer and, um, you know, people were saying that I'm sort of sold out or, or whatever, because I'm talking about money now and I'm talking about like the experience that I have with Paul and people are going to get triggered. If you talk about money, if you, if you talk about cryptos, if you talk about NFTs, you know, people put, people put shit on like the fact that I have an NFT now, um, I've got the, the, the 88 NFTs and only 36 of them have, have sold. Like I didn't, it's, if you understand anything about NFTs, that means that like it hasn't been a, a raging success uh, in terms of the way NFT sales and stuff is done. I don't care because I'm using it in a different way with different goals. I know where I'm going. I know what community I'm building. And most of the people who I want to sell my NFT to don't own an NFT yet. They don't know what it is. And so it's really bad business to try and sell a product that people don't want and they don't know about. Um, you don't try and sell them a product, but I don't care because I can see where it's going and gradually people are becoming more aware of, oh, this is where it's going. Um, the NFT is 50% off anything that we do in our community. So if you were to want to have a house in Vanuatu, you're literally going to have 50% off your house. Like, so I know that the value is coming. Other people can't see it yet and that's fine. Um, it's everything's got its period of time, whether that person who was, you know, I had a massive conversation with that person after it, like I messaged him and said, Hey, like, you know, what's going on? What are you, what are you thinking? And there's, there's a whole backstory to it, but uh, I had a, I had a conversation with him. I had it with someone else who was like there in the comments. I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone who feels like I've done the wrong thing by them or that I'm not actually being my best self and trying to put myself out into the world. I have had issues with people in the past, like anyone has, like I've had conflict with, you know, I can think of, I was writing down everyone I could think of that I had conflict and there was like 13 people, right? So in my whole life, I can think of 13 people who probably think I'm a dick um, and I've had conflict with. Okay, like I, ideally I would be able to resolve that with, with all of them, um, if I can find some of them and whatever, but like, that's life. You're not going to be at peace with everybody. Everyone's not going to love you, but it is tough when someone says like, I, I think, you know, I think you're a liar and a cheat, whatever. I'm like, well, all I see is that I'm working from sunup to sundown a lot of days offering more value than anyone that I know of. Uh, I'm doing one-to-one -one calls with people for free all over the world. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my, like, I'm literally like working myself to the point of it being too much sometimes because I care about this so much and because I really want it to work for sure. There's an orange part of it. Like, of like, I want it to work as a business. Like it, it's on all the levels that like, I want it to work. Um, it's tough, man. It is tough, but like, I would rather it be tough. I would rather be criticized than not do what I know I need to do. And it also does help to be honest. Like it really, it helps of like, yeah, no, I really, really want to do this. Like I really, really believe in it and I'm really, really going to make it work. And if I don't, then yeah, I'm going to look like a fool. If I do, then, you know, I, I will have done what I value most. And, um, you know, maybe I generate wealth in the process. Maybe I help a lot of my friends to become wealthy. Like that's the biggest goal with Uncommon Success. Like, that's literally why it started. It was like, I became wealthier than I thought I ever could be. And I wanted other people to have that opportunity i want other people to have that opportunity i know that most people don't have any financial education i didn't either i tried to find it i read books and stuff reading books is like level one you know like watching youtube stuff knowledge is great like new knowledge is, is important but it doesn't actually do anything like people are consuming all sorts of content and and very few people are actually doing any achieving any significant level of success on the back of content the next level is to take action and very few people uh, have the accountability around action. It gets tough. It gets confusing. You're not quite sure. You get to a block and you just fall off and you never come back or you come back five years later and you missed out on all sorts of different things. And then the third level that I'm really passionate about in success is the connection. You know, you have to be connected to other people who are ahead of you in the game. Like it's that triple threat Alex Formosi talks about as well. Have accountability by people that are at a similar level to you 
have accountability from sort of ex students or successful students, people who are like one, two, three, five years into the journey, like Nico for you, um, like, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. I have a list of all these people who I've worked with before who have had extreme success. That's the next level. And then, you know, the level above that is like uh, mentors who are a million miles above where you want to be, who you hope one day that you could meet and shake their hands. And my goal is to have people like, you know, Jordan Peterson and Jocko Willink and Joe Rogan and David Goggins. I, I think I'm going to be able to convince them and maybe I'm batshit crazy, but I think I'm going to be able to convince them to offer like an hour of their time to speak to our community or even an hour of their time to one person in our community who has achieved extreme levels of progress, that's been extremely disciplined, that's turned up to these 25 day challenges and they've done everything. And they've shown like, this is what happened with my bank account. This is what happened with my body. And we can prove like concrete results, extreme discipline, you know, massive production achievement. I think that people like that will be willing to interact and donate and participate in things like this. Um, I've floated it to a few people who I really respect and they're like, yeah, of course, like I definitely, like I would love to speak to someone who's had that huge transformation in themselves if they think that that conversation could help them. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, like every day at the moment I'm come like there's new stuff coming to me. It's like the ideas use me. There's a concept that Bob Proctor introduced to me. The biggest investment I've ever made in myself was to go and spend five or six days in Hawaii with Bob Proctor. One of the things that he says is like that, the ideas use you, like you put yourself to the service of the ideas that that come to you. And that, uh, that's how it feels to me. I, I, and I think that my best life is whatever ideas come to me, like wherever they're coming from, God, universe, somewhere in the recesses of my history, genetic code, I don't know, I don't care. But those, those, those like ideas, that's what I treasure most is like the thing of like, so when I'm speaking to someone, when I'm doing like mentoring, if you want to use that word, I'm trying to get to like, what do they really want? What have they done in the past that like in terms of skills, like what skills have they believed they, they developed? What beliefs do we need to crash and put to the side of like, oh, there's no money in this. Like, well, let's analyze that belief and see if that's a valuable one, if it's valid. If it is, then good. If it's not, then you know, maybe we can replace that belief with something that you know, helps you um, get to another level. So if we can improve skills, improve beliefs, and then improve traits, which is the consistency stuff that we're doing, which the handstand and the juggling, that's traits um, development more so than I don't, I care less about the skills than I do about the traits and the beliefs. So those things act on the level of the traits and the beliefs. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that I'm, I'm crazy enough to think that extremely successful people are going to want to come to the, the physical locations, come to events, um, donate, you know, can put an hour of their time towards it. And we can pay, pay them for their time as well. But I think some people would probably rather do it for nothing because they love it and they can see the work that's gone into it than to be paid for something. It's, it's both things are good and we'll, we'll do both. Like I'll pay super high end speakers to come to things for Uncom members and it'll be the members with the NFTs and the members who've achieved the, the most, you know, doing the work. Like they'll be the ones who get access because. And, and to be honest, like sometimes it'll be the ones that can pay the most as well. Like that's okay too, because money is the cleanest form of exchange. Like hating people for making money is, is, is a dangerous world that you create uh, because you hate achievement at that point. And so many people deeply reject money. And so they're deeply rejecting achievement. And to reject, reject achievement, you, you reject your biggest ideas. You reject things of like, well, I don't need that much money. Therefore, I don't need to be that good at anything. Therefore, I don't need to provide that much value to the world. Um, the the bank the um what's his name the the youtuber i'm thinking of banksy now because we had bankso but um mr beast podcast that was a phenomenal expansion of my way of thinking of about money it's like hey you don't actually need who cares whether you hold on to the money or not all you need to be able to do is access the money if you can access massive amounts of wealth then you're wealthy he can do whatever he wants he can work for whoever he wants he can get the amount of money that he needs to do whatever he wants because He's Mr. Beast. He's the most successful YouTuber. So he could go and work for any marketing agency. He, go, he, he has complete freedom to do whatever he wants, despite not keeping any of the money. But he's extremely wealthy because he's the most powerful man on YouTube in a way. Like he's the most successful person on YouTube. So I could care less whether people, you know, it doesn't matter whether you keep any of the wealth or whether you save it to buy villages or whether you, whatever you do, 
but be the person who has that because the, for the majority of people, the only way they're going to access money is to become more valuable. Like if I talk to people, okay, like get wealthy, they think about becoming smarter at what, what they do with their money and being of more service to people. You know, a, a very small percentage of people go to like, you know, illegal activity, illicit activity, which is kind of the connotation that being wealthy has of like, oh, you have to be a bad person. Very few people that are wealthy uh, have done it in that way. And nobody in my experience has resorted to those sorts of things when we started to talk about um, becoming wealthy. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a tough it's a tough one to crack. And some people might be triggered by this conversation now of like, well, I, I just need I need just enough. The amount of people that say that it's an excuse to not achieve, you know. So mm-hmm. that that these high achieving people, I think some of them will want to support this culture. It's like, no, you know, what, what if you replace that belief with the belief of I want to be as valuable as I can be. I want to solve whatever things I'm here to, to potentially be able to solve and I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice and make effort to develop myself to the point where I can make these sort of, you know, contributions. Everyone has these things that, like, that should really change about the world. Whatever that thing is, that's what you're meant to do. Like, change that thing. And it's... You won't be able to do it until you get red, blue, orange, green, and then you'll be able to change it if it's like one of those big things. But everyone's got that stuff, and, and most of us just file it under too hard and live, you know, these quiet lives of desperation, misery. Um, I can't live like that. You know, I, I tried living without a purpose for a period of time, and it's just it's, 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 a, it's impossible for me. Like, I literally can't live if I don't feel as though I'm work, you know, there's something for me to achieve. I, I feel as though that's how we're designed as goal-seeking organisms. Again, that, that's Bob Proctor. I don't know. He, he quotes other people. But I, I just quote it all back to him. But we're goal-seeking organisms. Like if, if when we don't have a goal, if you look at children, it's in their nature. No child finds it easy to walk. No child decides I'm not going to walk because it's too hard. Like at six months old, the child cannot walk. They think it's impossible. There's no way. How are you doing that? I'd love to do it. We spend all day working on it. Like I want to stand up like these people. And it doesn't even look like they're trying to stand up. But from very early on, they're trying to stand up and it's very difficult and it looks impossible and it looks impossible. And then, you know, you ask the six-month-old baby, you know, stand up, walk across the room. They can't even understand the words, let alone do the thing. If you ask the six-year-old, hey, can you stand up and walk across the room? They're going to giggle at you because it's so easy. Mm. That's the transition people go through in these in these programs and these projects is like you go from thinking like, oh, it's super hard to make 10 grand a month online to being like, well, I could make 10 grand a month online doing this and this and this and this and this. And I, you know, I could connect with that person about that. It's the same as learning to walk. It's literally applying the mental faculty to the thing that you want to achieve, moving the limiting beliefs out of the way and just getting to work. Every, everyone can solve it. Like it's not, it's not rocket science to, to, to build a business. I'm not saying it's always easy. Like it's harder than harder than having a job. It's harder than being a slave. Uh, you know, if that was like the way that in red, you know, the, the red worker might be a slave, the blue worker might be a um, someone who works for a salary. And then, you know, orange would be more entrepreneurial. But um, yeah, it's up to each of us to decide. If someone decides they want to stay at a certain level of development, that's fine. Like that's what... Graves calls it like the levels of human development. Uh, Paul introduced me to all this stuff. There's another psychologist that introduced us to called Uspensky. Uspensky stuff's really interesting. Got a book, mm-hmm. Levels of Human Development, I think. Uh, and we're talking about almost the same stuff, human potential. I don't know. I forget the title of the book. It's only pretty short and it's on YouTube. It's a poor reading, but it's only like three hours. And um, and he's got longer books that are like 20 hours on, on uh, Audible and stuff that are a bit harder going. But the key concept is like we get 50% by free ride. So 50% of your potential, you'll access no problem. Like you kind of just get it by default, by being around other people in school and whatever. You get 50%. If you want to access the other 50%, then you have to choose. You have to sacrifice. Um, and you're going to have to want it. And most people don't want it. And that's fine. They're just going to live in this first 50%. And that's, that's their decision. My thing is, like, I would love people to make that decision. If you're staying there, it's fine. If you want to, you know, explore further, I'm not sure where I'm at on the journey. I think I'm, like, this far. Maybe I'm, like, I'm a fraction ahead of a few people uh, in terms of these models. I'm probably behind in other models. But 
uh, I think there's a lot more for us to explore. And, and that's, to me, that's what's most interesting is like, what, what is our potential? What could we do if we really set our hearts to experiencing our potential? And Spensky's work gets kind of squirrely and deep where it's like, you know, how does that even work? But um, that key concept was like, is one that Paul speaks about a lot. It's like the, you get a free ride to 50%. If you want to access the other 50, then you, you have to make a decision and, and make sacrifices that most people won't make. Yeah, I think you made a really good point there. Like it, just deciding if you're going to stay at that initial 50% and you're okay with that, that's cool. And then if you're going to strive, then go for it. But if you're kind of in limbo, you know, not happy and just kind of rotting, then you're, it's like the worst of both worlds. So yeah, just being like wh whatever position you choose, just being like owning the position and the decision that you're making. I think that's a really good point that you made. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't be that person who's got like a nine to five goes to the pub and, you know, lives. Uh, I just, I knew from early on that that was never going to be me. I, I wrote an essay about it at school. The one English assignment that I got a decent result was just slamming mediocrity in the school system, basically. And I, I got a good result for that one. I wasn't great at English. Uh, writing hasn't been a strength or something that's come naturally to me. Um, grammar and all those things. But that was the, that was the one that, actually did okay was when I said I definitely don't want to be I don't I can't I'll be anything but middle of the pack you know so I know there are other mm -hmm. people who feel like oh well and um, it can feel really lonely <laughs> and but that's pretty much why I had to leave footy to be honest was because I was really successful in that and it wasn't going to get any better than like winning the championship breaking the records there was no way it was going to get any better than that all we could do was do it again and that would be you know cool but I was like, well, if this is it, like, it's not for me. Like, I, I know I need to do more than this. Um, this culture, it's a really high-performance culture and it was a really positive culture as far as rugby goes, but it wasn't enough. And I was like, okay, well, how do I – what else is there? Can I find something else that I want to be part of? I couldn't really find a culture that uh, I really – you know, that, that was for me kind of thing. The closest thing was probably Edo stuff in a way, but there was, you know, there were challenges with, with that community and culture and there wasn't really room for me to grow in the way I wanted to grow. Like you couldn't present, you couldn't be uh, online coach. Like there was, a, there were a lot of barriers within that system. And to be honest, like the, the, the training four hours a day plus is not really my thing anyway. Like I'm more interested in this other stuff and just I like, I kind of like training minimally, you know, and, and do this mm. other stuff. I'm much more passionate about solving these other things now that I have about um, wanting to train all day uh but yeah the the process uh for you know of creating a culture and like transitioning and creating it's yeah it would i had some success with it with real movement and now this is like really really what i want to create and be around these entrepreneurial people and people who explore new ideas and um connect with other communities for sure as well like if you're out there and you're like there's something really like this that you, I'm sure you'd really like and you'd like these people that like, connect me with them, you know, like tell me who it is and I'll join their group or I'll meet, you know, people who are playing in that game because the more those, these sorts of people come together, the better it's going to be. And that's part of the goal with what we're doing is like, how can we bring regenerative agriculture experts into this place and help them to be, you know, better funded. And like I spoke this morning with Barley Foragers, they're getting massive returns on meat production so how can we bring massive returns on meat production together with people who produce a lot of meat and, you know, using like the other conversation I had this morning, one of them was with Devolve NFTs and that's like, what's the future of NFTs look like? And they were actually discussing how that could be used for regenerative agriculture where the animal is the NFT and then you have like the burning and you have like the rewards go back into the system in like a stable coin. So it's like... My thing, like if I bring all these things together is my dream coming true. And I think that's probably what I'm best at in a way. It's like linking different ideas that haven't been linked before. Um, that's that's kind of where good new things come from. It's creativity is like linking. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because you're the third person who said that. And the two other guys are like super, super smart in the fitness industry. Like Andy Fawcett, he's the, the one of the, top three guys in GMB fitness and um john goodman from online training academy they they both said the same thing <laughs> as you as well so it's uh 
it's uh, you're all thinking the same way like connecting dots that aren't already there so yeah just wanted to, to let you know that as well yeah that's a that's a pretty cool uh, crowd to to be connected with and yeah it's definitely not a not an individual not a unique thought but a lot of people think they're not creative because they're like they think they're going to come up with something that's never existed before but i, I think like link when you understand that it's linking together ideas, it's, it gives people a bit more permission to to know that they are going to create new things if they continue to um, just explore what they value most. And like Ben Patrick's a great example of it with ATG. People criticise it of like, oh, it's just Poliquin stuff. Like, no, it's not just Poliquin stuff because Charles didn't get this message across to people and, and people didn't do it. And, it, you know, they didn't understand how it all fits together. They didn't sequence it in this way. They didn't sequence it in the ATG method, they didn't uh, they didn't market it in, in this way. They weren't as approachable and such. So it is something completely new and different that has built on Charles's work, but it's also got key important influences from the gymnastics world, you know, that uh, are key parts of the system. And Jeff Wolf worked for gymnastic bodies and he made contributions to the ATG um, system. And that gymnastic component is extremely valuable to, so to say it's all just Charles, no, like and Edo was influenced by Charles, but I don't think uh, Coach Summer necessarily was that influenced by Charles. I don't know. Ch Coach Summer was massively influenced by Greg Glassman, I think. You know, he was one of the early, you know, participants in uh, in CrossFit. Um, and uh, so was Edo Portal. I think Edo Portal had the first CrossFit outside of the States, uh, if, I, if I'm not right. mistaken. Um, so, yeah, like there's, there's always, you know, there's always connections and uh, you're not going to do it on your own. Like it's okay to use and borrow. And I think that's a really cool thing about ATG is, you know, that it has given more people permission to use all the stuff. Like I think that's part of the reason it grew so fast is because it wasn't trying to be proprietary limited. You know, it was like, here it is on YouTube. I'm explaining it the best way I can. And people felt like that was really generous. And so they reciprocated with generosity and it grew to tens of thousands of members like in record time. Um, it's now mm -hmm. probably the most influential, most used system in training. Charles didn't want to do that. Charles was premium, working with Olympic champions, the most expensive gym in town. Charles had a different ambition and he created something different. You know, ben should get credit for creating something that's different and unique and, and solved in his own way. And, and everybody should solve in their own unique way. No one, everyone who tries to be Ben Patrick, like people are kind of trying to be Ben Patrick in a way, like some out of respect and out of like whatever, but people are modeling off Ben. That's great. And do it as best you can. You're never going to be Ben Patrick. Like if you like soccer more than you like basketball, then you're already not Ben Patrick. If you're 22 instead of 30, then you're not Ben Patrick. If you have children or you don't have to like, you know, every individual difference means that the product will be different. Your experiences, everyone's had those unique experiences. So everyone has something important and unique to create. Even if you think you're trying to create exactly the same thing, like some of what I've created now is quite similar to Garrett Jay White's uh, warrior program. It's like a men's development program. Uh, I went over, I flew over to the United States to do it. I think it might've been $3,000 US for 36 hours. You stay, stayed in a hotel and then, um, yeah, went and did all this, all these stuff. And it was kind of like a military type style of thing. Like they make it, made us get really cold in and out of the ocean. It was like 11 degrees outside, windy um, in the night, like middle of the night, getting in and out of the ocean for hours and hours. I was the skinniest guy there and I was shivering like crazy. I sort of was looking at what he was doing and like, yeah, I really want to do this. Like, and I felt almost bad because it was like, I want to do this. Like, this is like men's, this men's development stuff, like accountability, people getting rich. Like, this is really cool. That was a 2017. And I even said it, I think, in the sales process of like, man, like I kind of help men to get their stuff together and go to a next level. And I also work with a few women, but it's like 99, you know, 95%, 90% men. And um, yeah, it's, you know, I, whatever. Um, but the, I felt like it was so, like it resonated with me so strongly that I felt bad about like doing my own version of it in a way. Now I'm doing it and it's like no one would even recognize that like there's no connection now. Like it's so different to what he offered and how he offered it. Mm -hmm. And like the whole thing is like so different. But at one stage, like I was kind of offering like a fraction of what he was offering in terms of you know, the, um, the accountability and stuff and the event style. And that's what the guy said to me on the sales calls. Like, bro, there's, there's only one warrior thing and, you know, you're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to, you're not going to do this. 
and it was yeah, it was like me being almost like full of myself as well. Like I was I was doing quite well at the time with the business and stuff, and like to think that I was going to do anything like what they were doing, like was kind of fanciful as well. Like so, don't even flatter yourself with thinking that you need to worry about like copying someone too much because you couldn't if you wanted to, and it won't be the same anyway. So just go as hard as you can at what you believe in most, and and it, it'll be something considerably different um, by the time you get anywhere near where you want to be very good mate so i'm just conscious of time i've got i've got a call coming up in about 10 minutes but i'd like to to finish with a question uh if you were to put a if you were to put something on a billboard in somewhere like times square uh where millions of people would see it what would you put there and why build your best build your best life this is uh, pretty much at the core of it. Yeah. I think if, 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 if you just woke up each morning and thought about that, uh, it'd probably be a good thing. A friend of mine has a test of like your first five seconds of the day. If you don't feel excited about the day, then you're doing it wrong. Um, so that would be like a lit litmus test for this sort of billboard slogan. And if you feel like that's not you're not at that point right now where you get out of the bed and you're you're quite excited for it, then like drop me a DM. I'm pretty good at helping people go from the position where they're not that excited about life to where they've got some stuff that they're working on. They're like, yeah, I'll get I'll get out of bed today. Like I'll, I'll get this done. Mm. We'll even get into the Jordan Peterson thing of like I'll get out of bed and I'll make it straight away, and then I get my first win for the day. Uh, that to be honest, like I wasn't really consistently making my bed until that that it was literally Jordan Peterson. Like I literally took that on. Like I'd had success in other things, but it was in the last whatever a few years when I when I heard that. And maybe Akira, Akira the Don with his creativity, like maybe that's a that maybe that's a better question for you, uh Connor, to uh, if you had to make a song with Akira the Don, what what lyrics would you put in there? If you haven't checked out Akira the Don, then you're Who's definitely in, in for a treat. He's put music to like Rogan, Jocko Willink, uh, Elon right. Musk, Naval. It's the yeah. best stuff. I play it to my kids and that. It's like one of the what Elon Musk ones is like, if you don't make stuff, there is no stuff. Okay, that, that, that would probably be on the other billboard across the street. Like I love that. Like, that all the anti-capitalist kind of communist sentiment out there of like, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll UBI, like we'll, we'll pay people welfare to make the economy work. So no, if you don't make stuff, there is no stuff. Like we have to create, we have to keep making stuff. You can't yeah. just make money. Like money is nothing. It's it's a tool that facilitates the exchange of, of real stuff that real people make in their minds and with their hands. And so, uh, yeah, that like I've, my children have that kind of burnt into their brain from listening to that song on loop while we're playing Lego. You know, and I, I say like, if you don't make <laughs> Lego, there is no stuff. And yeah, like we talk about yeah. So uh, yeah, Akira stuff. Akira stuff is uh, is phenomenal. So um, yeah, one more potential gem for those who made it to the end of the podcast. I know if you, <laughs> if you got to, if you got to Akira, then you're one of the hardcore few. Uh, who yeah. Persisted. So build your best and the first five seconds of the day. If you're not excited, then send you a DM, and that's just a, a kind of a metric to to see if things are on track. If you if you need a bit of help. Yeah, the first five mate. seconds win then do something about it like don't don't settle for that something needs to change maybe you don't need to do all this stuff that i'm talking about but you, you need to do something because life's meant to be good i'm, I'm pretty sure of that yeah and i've well, been Keegan, down too yeah for sure what, mate i know what it's like to be down and it's not it's not a place to live like do something about mm. it because you can change it and the nutrition like, there's a lot of stuff listen to the podcast again there's a lot of tips there with connor said mm. and, and i've shared but we're here to help you. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's what we're, we're both about. And there are a lot of people out there like us who, who want people to live better, have a better experience of life. Uh, and I'm, I'm just a player in the game. Same as, same as everyone else working hard. Thanks so much, Connor. <laughs> Thank you, mate. I was really excited about the podcast and um, just, there was so many things to talk to you about, but yeah, you just knocked it out of the park, mate. So before I let you go, where, where do you want people to, you know, look up more about what you're about. Is it social media? Is your website, or what's the best place to check out more about what you're doing? Yeah, so ATG you can check out on ATG for coaches. 
uncommonsuccess.com if you want to join ATG for Coaches. Uh, Uncommon Success is, uh, so ATG for Coaches is $100 a month. There's a discount code for the first month. That's a phenomenal community. You get direct contact with Ben Patrick pretty much every day in the Pulse. Like there's, uh, there's, there's an extreme level of support that is uncommon in, uh, in coach development programs. I never gave the sort of value that he gives. And it's, it's very cheap for what you get, in my opinion and experience. Uh, then uncommonsuccess.com, all spelled how it should be spelled, is how you can become part of Uncommon Success. It's $97.00. You get an onboarding call with a member of the team. And then if you complete the onboarding process, then you get a call with me as well. So you get a call with me as well. Uh, we'll, we'll have some one-to-one -one time. I'm not going to be able to do that up to 10,000 members, but I can definitely do it at the moment. And I will be excited to meet you literally and genu genuinely. So uncommonsuccess.com. Uh, in terms of just following my stuff, like there's a YouTube channel for Uncommon Success and we're just one for ATG for coaches and uh, ATG mentor on Instagram and uncommon success uncommon under, underscore success on instagram but if you dm on atg mentor uh, that's that's probably the best place to initiate a conversation um, it's where i'm most most contactable so thanks that's so much okay. for having I'll me make sure um, my pleasure mate i'll make sure and link all that in the show notes as well okay champion thank you awesome